Hello, everybody, and welcome to Rocket Lasso Live, Season 2, Episode 14. And today, I have a very special guest. I have Rick Barrett from Maxon. Welcome. Hey, everybody. Thanks, Chris. Yeah, thank you very much for coming online uh, with me to answer questions. Uh, Rick has been at Maxon, which we just found out for about 20 years now. Somebody in the comments was like, I didn't even know the Cinema 4D was around for 20 years. Yeah, yeah. it was actually on version 5 back then. Yeah. What, what what was the name of Cinema 4D before it was Cinema 4D? Uh, Fast Ray, Mini Ray, Fast Ray, I think. Fast Ray. Fast Ray? Yeah. I can't remember for sure. I think it was Fast Ray. Uh, but that was case, before my time, though. I'm not that old. Yeah. <laughs> no. Well, you you said I think you said you jumped on at version five, uh, yeah. which is I, I I remember when the uh, the R6 was coming out on the front of 3D World, the CD that came with 3D World magazine. Um, we are already using it in the classroom then is right when I started version six. Hey, sorry for the little technical difficulties, but we are back and we're continuing with a little bit of news because uh, I forget it's uh, starts on April, what, 20th, Rick, for the April live 20th. Oh, I'm not sharing my screen to you, am I? Uh, I hadn't clicked that yet. So, yeah, go ahead and share the screen. Yeah, and so uh, April 20th. Uh, we've got 11 days and 20 hours until virtual NAB. This is uh, exciting. Not quite as exciting as the real thing, but uh, if we can't do that, we'll do this. And uh, it's uh, really cool. We've got a uh, full list. I was just looking at the full list of, of presenters and presentation schedule. I didn't realize they'd already put this in yet. Uh, but uh, some really exciting presenters this year, and uh, we're doing it a little bit different. We're actually going to be doing an hour and a half for each presentation, and that's in order to – the presentations are still going to be about the same length, but we're going to leave a little bit more time for Q&A and for uh, folks to pop in questions that maybe don't even relate to the presentation and try and address those sort of in between the presentation times. So, uh, yeah, it all kicks off a week from Monday on, uh, at eight 30 Pacific time with, uh, news and announcements from Dave McGavern. Yeah, that's going to be excellent. And then we got Andrew Kramer. I didn't realize he was speaking. You got Seth, uh, Seth Worley. I got some great, great names here. Should yeah. be good. Uh, and then I am going to be still doing my presentation and I am on April 22nd and I scheduled it. So it's going to be the exact time that this stream usually would be. So that will be the official stream of that week. So mm -hmm. that should be that should be fun. Oops, uh, that's not what the schedule says. Oh, they didn't update it. Well, I'll, <laughs> I'll poke them. It's Don't, supposed to be the, the schedule's there. still liable to change a little bit uh, between now and then. So uh don't don't lock in your your schedule just yet. We'll we'll figure this out, guys. Yeah, I'll double check it with them too. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then, uh, oh yeah, you had mentioned something about Cineversity. Do you want to cover that too? Oh yeah. I well, I, without mentioning it because I guess YouTube doesn't like it. Uh, the during the uh, the current situation, uh, Cineversity is free for thirty days to anybody, even if you don't have a Cineversity subscription. So, if you go to my.maxon.net my or log in through Cinema 4D, you should see an an opportunity to add a Cineversity account uh, for a period of time. Yeah, which is excellent. There's tons of material on there. One of the very first tutorials i ever recorded was actually for cineversity i had made this crazy yeah, the tree, right? tree rig tree growing yeah. rig. it's actually how i met rick and a bunch of people at maxon was i brought that along on a thumb drive to uh nab or siggraph and uh it was definitely siggraph at that time and yeah i i show, i remember i showed uh i showed somebody i knew and then she said you got to show this to kai and then i showed it to kai and kai's you said you got to show this to rick <laughs> And then Rick said, you got to show this to Paul. Uh, and then Paul said, you should come out to dinner with us. And, you know, I've been hanging out with you guys ever since. The rest is history. Um, <laughs> so and I, that's that's still going to be up there. And I mean, Thinking Particles hasn't changed uh, too much since then. <laughs> yeah. Now there's field it's forces. It's probably still doable. It's still, it still works. <laughs> um, so... Uh, let's see. Uh, I guess that pretty much covers it. Does anybody, yeah, start point that people put the questions back in again. I super appreciate it. And, uh, why don't we go ahead and start taking some questions and getting into cinema 4d or we'll just see what kind of things we get here. Uh, Mick, what do you got? How would you go about creating a, uh, a, a, 
bass relief similar to this woman on horseback imagery? This sounds like a similar question that we got last week. Let's see what we're looking at. I'm going to take a look quickly. It does and, sound like that one from last week. Oh, yeah, it is. It's actually actually it. I guess it's a slight variant on there. And it'd be fun to have a conversation about this. Uh, let me pop the proper screen up. So um, this is it looks like some actual yeah Greek and Rome mm. relief. So it's a similar question to last week where last week somebody showed a black and white image. In fact, here I can show you um, uh, kind of the idea. There's this amazing artist and they seem to draw these because I found their website. It's going to take me just a moment to pull this up properly. Uh, so this is a link from last week. And this artist here, uh, I think that they might be Chinese, but I'm not totally sure. But they have hundreds of these works and they're these incredibly detailed. Yeah, it's Chinese. So these incredibly detailed relief images. And if you look at this as a depth pass, if you just took this and you uh, put it in the displacement channel, you would end up with an image like this, where there's a lot of dimension, but it's still very flat. But um, I don't know, Rick, would, uh, if you were to make one of these, would I, I would think my approach would just be to, to make a cube or a flat plane and start using the sculpting tool and start like tracing it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I if I was... If I was just trying to cheat it quickly, I don't know, maybe if you used one of those tools that takes an image and generates a normal map out of it or displacement map out of it, you could you could get a good start from there. I mean, it would be a mo it would not be a model. It'd just be a displacement map. Uh, but depending on how you were using it, that might be an option. Yeah. And actually, on top of that, uh, I think you could do a pretty good hybrid method, which is, which is if let's say you literally had this image and you wanted to bring it in cinema. And I'm not going to do it here because it's just going to be a lot of sculpting time. But if you were to take this and like Rick is saying, bring it in some sort of app that generates a, a normal where it's trying to like analyze the lighting, create a nice normal that might do a pretty good job. Um, but even if you don't have even that much, if you just took this image, brought it in as a displacement and put in cinema, it's not going to give you a proper relief, but it's going to give you a lot of detail. And then if you took that and you started sculpting on top of it, like pulling and pushing just a little bit up from the surface, I think you could use that as base reference and create a, a very shallow depth map on the entire thing. There, I can't think of any easy way around it, like to do it automatically, except to sort of do it for real. Like these types of things are sculpted by hand where there's like a chisel or uh, there's a, a really cool thing. I've watched some videos. I've watched some videos online where people are working with like tin and copper and they'll have a just a, like an anvil and a little hammer and they go ding, 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 ding. And they keep on hammering out and denting these things. So it's like you just it's like drawing an image. But instead of shading like shadow, you're shading depth. And every you know strike of the hammer is more depth in the image. Yeah, and another thing that I don't think that people consider doing quite enough is uh, camera mapping. So you could take this, again, depending on how you're using it, you could take this and just put very basic sculpt underneath it and then camera map uh, this image. Like if you were trying to like take an image that you already had and add some depth to it, you could add camera mapping basically to, to do that. That's that's actually very true. I remember a really old school uh, like tutorial, I think, from Maxon, where you could just do some basic camera mapping, and you can have a, a building with a ton of detail and all these windows and everything. But if you just get the face of it and a couple of key extrudes, the rest of it just sort of is faked in there really well. Like if you if when you play a video game, like everything's incredibly low poly, and the normal map is bringing out a lot of that detail. So if you have this image, if you have the image that you know we have this reference here. Uh, if you just project this and you just do the most basic of sculpting, like just raise this area, raise the area just a little bit, and you put the image on top of it, it's going to read pretty well. Now, if you're doing super close-ups, zooming the camera around very carefully, it's not going to hold up. But if it's a, a smaller element within a bigger scene, you could probably get away with not doing that much work on it. But let's go ahead and find some additional questions, see if we can actually get into the software. So let's see. Scroll. That was from... Twitch, so I'm going to click on YouTube, and let's see what we got here. 
Hmm. Oh, that's a that's a kind of uh, Rincon is asking a question that I actually have no idea how I'd even tackle without just super faking it. But it'd be could you could we make a prism and light with light rays passing through them, where it's like separating out the seven colors using like dispersion. Um, I, don't, I don't even know how I'd go about doing something like that. Um, yeah, remember how we said at the beginning we're not the rendering guys? <laughs> that is true, and it is very specifically a rendering question. Like, but even when it comes into that, like a lot of the stuff, like stuff like chromatic aberration, like that's a kind of a post effect. That's a very specific thing that it wasn't really getting implemented in the software until it kind of became popular as this manual way of doing it. So a prism separating light in that way is so specific that it feels more. It, it, it's like you need this very scientific like you know like white paper type of thing of like oh here's this exercise and it took like insanely long to compute because we're actually doing the light rays and calculating the different wavelengths of light well right now almost any renderer is going to be uh any kind of chromatic aberration kind of thing where you get different colors is kind of a fake on top of it, or a very simple algorithm on top of everything but the idea of calculating all the different rays of light and their different wavelengths in order to separate them out in a prism is seems well beyond the scope of any render engine that I'm aware of. If you're going to do it realistically now going and faking it like artistically, like, you know, at a point you can just grab a couple different types of light, make visible light beams and, sure. and cast those. But that's at that point, it's almost just straight up uh, artistic and not a mechanical process, but let's mm -hmm. go ahead and uh, let's see. Uh, somebody saying that uh, certain versions of V-Ray might be able to do it. Uh, hey, Darren, how's it going? Rincon. Hello. Jewel. But yeah, right now, maybe there's somebody who's like an expert in Octane and Octane can do it or something, but that is not, <laughs> that is not me and Rick. So no. let's, let's keep going. Um, uh, Michael, how would you approach the stylized tail animation? Let's see what we got here. Sharing my screen. Skyli stylized tail animation. Ooh, okay, we got 2D animation. This is from... Uh, Hen Henrik Baron, oh, Barwon, Barone, Baroni, Baroni. I'm terrible with names. Yeah. Henrik Baroni. Let's see what we got. You're here. brave saying them out loud. <laughs> I, yeah, I do my best. I want, I want to give credit where I can. Yeah. Uh, whoa. Okay. So specifically, the question's kind of on this tail. It's really cool. So first of all, this is probably hand drawn. Yeah, it's like 2D character animation. So this was entirely hand done. Um, let's see. When I see that, I think a lot about most spline and just its ability to do bends and twirls and and extend the spline and things like that. Yeah, totally agreed. Um, what's going through my head would be um, how do I articulate this? Imagine if you drew the tail, see all the different motions it's going through. And it's kind of traveling through them. So imagine if like this tail curled up and it curls over, it goes up 90 degree angle, another curve, another curve. And then you only ever show a small section of it. And that small section is clamped to like, you know, here attached to the butt of the cat. And so it's like, you're only seeing that section. You're kind of like offsetting what you're seeing, but it's snapping to this particular place. So it's like, you're passing through this animation, but it stays sort of static. Uh, yeah, I kind, I kind of follow you. I, I'm trying to think. Well, here, I think you'll see quickly. I'm going to I'm gonna tackle it a little bit here, and you stop me when I'm doing it wrong, because I'm actually not sure how to get to the final step here. So here we are in Cinema 4D R21, and I'm going to quickly draw. I'm just going to I'm just going to draw it with a pen tool. Uh, so these are not going to be perfect arcs and whatnot. But if I were to draw something like that, and I'm going to counter rotate 90 degrees. Let's go another 90 degrees and then we'll do, uh, I guess I'll break the tangent there, holding down shift and we'll go straight up a wee little bit, Oop, uh, go straight up and drag. I do love that you can hit undo while drawing the splines, the old splines. If you drew it wrong, you would have to start again. And I'll just break. So I'm just giving us a little bit of room here. And we'll do one more curve. So that's not 
super elaborate, but that's kind of a, you know, a couple different shapes of the tail. Now we have a couple different options here, but actually most spline is the one that my brain immediately goes to. If we make a most spline, we can set this to spline mode and in spline mode, feed it uh, a different spline. So we could do something like this. So now we're seeing a new one. Now I'm going to visually hide the original. So we're only seeing most spline and I don't like seeing the full shape. So I can set that to line. So this is actually most spline overlaid on the previous one, but you'll see that I can draw this back now. So it's a way of drawing on a spline very nicely. So if we only view, let's say 25% of this, if we offset this, then it's going to travel all the way through and it actually, you know, overshoots the beginning and end, which is really cool that you can get those, but we can turn them off by saying, don't extend the start or end. So by keyframe, so here's the idea. We would start at the very beginning, which is maybe right about there. Maybe I'm giving us some extra, but that's fine. I'm going to record that. And then let's just say 90 frames later, we've offset to that being the final state. So now you can see we've got, we should at any given moment kind of see a cool stylized bit of tail. It's a, it's not moving at a consistent speed, but I might be able to fix that by changing this to a uniform spline type. There we go. Consistent speed now. Uh, it is viewing it uniformly. So if the spline is traveling constantly, my question goes to how could we essentially, while this is in the tail on the lock, donkey. Yeah, exactly. How do we pin this tail <laughs> on something? So here's a, here's a figure. We'll put, we'll try and put the tail on this thing, but how would we lock it there? We can get the location. Well, okay. I got, if you build a little bit of an espresso rig, maybe it wouldn't be too hard because yeah. and it might, it might lag one frame behind, but we could probably bake it and counter it. But here's my thought is, uh, can we move the most spline after the fact? Yeah, we can move that. That's free to move relative to the original one. So if we did something pretty straightforward, like create a, I'm gonna make it visual. So I'm gonna create a sphere and shrink it down, a, making an animation tag, aligning it to spline and aligning it to the most spline. Then you see it snapping to the end. And as this travels, I think it's gonna be stuck right there on the end. But now we have in the world, an absolute position. We see we have this sphere and it's saying its location. Now, if we make sure at the very beginning of the animation that this most spline is at the same place that is, uh, actually, no, that doesn't make sense. It'll have to put it into a null. Yeah, that makes sense. I'll make a, I'm gonna hit Alt-G to put that into a null and now pull it out. So this null is in the exact same spot as the sphere. If I put that in the null, then that should counter move. Would that need to be a second copy? Because even here, it looks like it offset. Is it going to be, is it going to move? Or is it wherever I move this null? Yeah, if I move the null there, then that's going to travel. And it's still in that same spot. But if I were to animate the null, it's going to move that. Is it create a feedback loop? Is my Probably. question. Probably. So let's, let's that's try it. Uh, well, Maybe try a constraint tag instead of Expressa. Oh, that's interesting. Well, we need to counter animate it, though. Yeah, I mean, the not... other way, and, and I don't, I'm not going to be able to figure out the math off the top of my head, but if you, you could pull the mo data for the first point of the spline, because the mo spline in, inherently has mo graph data. And oh, then yeah. you could use that mo data, but then you have to figure out sort of the, the offset matrix between. Sorry, this is getting really nerdy, guys. No, no, that's, <laughs> yeah, that's why we're here. That's why you're a the, guest here. The difference between the position and the the point where you wanted it, right? Yes, I'm thinking we can skip the. Well, essentially, what I've done is I've I've extracted. We don't need the mo data because a sphere is now giving us that like absolute position. So if this is now moving sort of two dimensionally because we drew it two dimensionally, then the thought is. And then we can't, this sphere is linked to this most spline, but now we have this copy, which I'll just rename copy, and which I am completely incapable of typing correctly. There we go. Uh, if we move that, you see that this null has the exact same position as the sphere. So uh, actually, do we want these both to be zeroed out? Maybe if I were to put the sphere into a null, then that's now a zero, zero. The sphere is at zero, zero, zero. If I were to put this null into a null, 
it is now at zero, zero, zero. Excellent. So those are very clean numbers for us to work from. So if I were to right click at a programming tag, Expresso, gives Expresso a second to pop up. If we take the information of the sphere and feed it into the null, I think it's going to double the effect. But what I'm going to do, uh, I'm just going to immediately do it. We can take the sphere and we're working in two dimensions, which is Y and X. So let's grab specifically the Y, oh, yeah, the X and the Y. And also for our null, we need the X and the Y. And those are their local positions, not their absolute. And local is fine because they're both in the same null for all purposes. Actually, they could literally be in the same null, but that's neither here nor there. Now we can directly connect this. And I think it's going to, what it should do is double the effect. So now you see it's actually moving twice as far. So that's kind of the opposite of what we want. But that means we should be able to just take this value and multiply it by negative one. So I'm going to search for a math node, pull in a math, feed in X, feed it out, make a duplicate of that, feed in Y, feed it out. So now we've got this in between node, select both of them. And I want to multiply by negative one. So what that should be saying is do the opposite. So with any luck, hit play and look at that. The tail wow. is stuck there. So we'd visually hide the original one. Now you just have to make sure your curl is proper. But now you can see we get this really cool animation and it's going to offset and all this other stuff was just reference. There might be a, we might be able to remove a few steps from there, but it is now stuck on the, and there's not even a frame of lag. I thought maybe it would twitch a little bit, but it's, it's doing a proper order of operations. So yeah. And uh, it's really, what's neat about this rig is we could at any point go back to this spline and modify it. So if we didn't like the curve or change something, updating this, it'll change the speed a little bit because of the length of the spline. But uh, yeah, I could T for scale here. Undo T for scale, scale that up, move it here. And now we got a larger section there. Rewind and hit play and it should just update. So besides the speed changing, that should just pretty much work and be largely, you can just update it and make it do whatever you want. And now you got spline, you can sweep it or, and it, this most spline only exists as this limited segment. So if we make an end side feed in a sweep, so we've got that feed in the sweep, feed in the end side, T for scale. Uh, oh yeah. I, I always forget with the, uh, the most spline is feeding, uh, thickness animation or thickness information. So I'm going to turn off rail scale and now it's going to be controlled via the end side. So I can scale this up to whatever scale, use the sweep and do an end growth of not end growth an end scale of zero. And now you got a full on tail here and it, you know, that can be any geometry, anything you want to render and it should just automatically work. Excellent. Uh, I wasn't sure we'd have something there, but it worked pretty well. Uh, I'm going to give this a save for anybody who's watching. Um, these scene files are all available on Patreon. So just a heads up there. And then me and Rick have a shared Dropbox folder here. So if at any point we need to swap files, we can do that. So, uh, stuck tail. Cool. Excellent. Uh, thanks very much for the question. That was neat. I mean, th th there might be some cool applications of that. I've never really thought about it. And I bet you there's a slightly more simplified way of doing it, but. It did work. Hmm. Yeah, yeah. I, I I can't think about a simplified or off the top of my head, but most blind is just so awesome because it's so flexible, and uh, I I really think that it's got a lot of power that uh, that people don't tap as much as they probably could. I totally agree. And I mean, honestly, I ignored it for a long time. And there are several things that most spline can uniquely do. And the big ones being remapping another spline. You can also use it as a very manual way of uh, resampling a spline. Yeah. Where you can, uh, if you have a point that's got way too many points and you want them to be very evenly distributed, you can use a most spline to do that. And the yeah, I th I've got a tutorial overlap. on Cineversity that does something like that for uh, remapping uh, to do like an audio visualization uh, being able to remap uh, a low density spline into a smoother, like a chema spline or something like that. So yeah, uh, it's really lots powerful. of, lots of stuff you can do with most spline. Do you, do you in any way remember how to use turtle mode? Yeah. 
Do you think you do you think you could do a quick turtle mode demo? Because I never know what to do. Uh, because I bet you most people have not even put it in the turtle mode, or they did it like I don't know what this is, and they immediately go away. I, I, I turtle mode's one of those that's going to embarrass me quickly, but um, basically. Um, you go in here to turtle mode and the idea here is just like, uh, when you did logo or I, I don't know, I'm old enough that I did logo, uh, in school. So, you know how you move the turtle forward and then turn it right and then move it forward again. So like if we do F for instance, you see that it moved forward that, that amount, right? And if we do F again, it's going to move forward double that amount. And if you go into the values here, you can say the default movement. So we can say what that is. Well, if we go in here and see, I forget. I always have to look at the help, um, which, uh, you know, any good, good thing to know. I'm sure most of you do. You can just right click on any parameter and show help. Uh, and and help's see. all online now. So he updated, which is wonderful. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, how do we turn F, H? It's all, it's, it's this, this code actually, it's not arbitrary. It actually relates to a, uh, a book called, or, or it's, it's more than a book, but it's, it shows up in a book called The Algorithm of Beauty of Plants. And uh, all of these types of, this is like sort of a, a normal scientific, nomenclature for this um somehow Turns so plus <laughs> and minus basically rotates us so if i go f plus f see how it rotated there and the default value is here so i can change this angle here to change how much that is going to rotate so if i do let's say 30 right and then i do plus f i'm going to get another and i can just keep doing that right well, I can also say that A equals F plus F. And then I can just say here A. But I can make this recursively. So I can say B equals F A. And then if I put B here, it's actually saying B equals F A and A equals F plus F. I can have B equal FAA, and it just kind of, so you can create these sort of intricate uh, interactions. And I, I have a tutorial on Cineversity that I'm not going to be able to reproduce right off the top of my head, where we actually create a tournament bracket um, out, of, out of Turtle. And the cool thing about it is that Turtle, you can actually, there's options for setting where a MoGraph object is going to appear forget how you do that off the top of my head. Oh, it's been a hilarious. long time since I played with Turtle. But you can set where a MoGraph object is going to be created. Um, and it'll actually, you can, you can put different MoGraph objects at different points within the Turtle. Yeah, you can kind of see this is an example of that. So you can create four different groups, I, J, K, and L. So if we did like, uh, B equals F I A A. Then we clone onto this. Let's uh, grab a sphere and we'll go into object mode, clone onto it, and then how do you limit it to? particular flavor it's what i'm trying to remember <laughs> <laughs> um interesting i actually i did not realize see even i have to use the help guys um <laughs> so a premise is fa let's just do this one here real quick a equals fx and x equals that. And how do we set the index? 
Maybe maybe there isn't an index. It's just like the first object is cloned on the one. So if you put a cube, maybe certain things are on the cube, certain things are on the sphere. Yeah, all these things need to be on the sphere. Actually. Maybe that was just a random guess, but interesting. Yeah, anyway, I we could we we probably should focus on things that we know how to do rather than reading <laughs> yeah <laughs> reading folks can do this on their own time yeah that's why doing uh, the bonus stream is but just reading there are it. some i think you know the the benefit here is to just so that people understand that this exists as a possibility there are, there is the ability to create these these stochastic spline systems and putting clones at specific points in that spline system. And if you really want to understand it better, I think that tournament bracket tutorial on Cineversity um, helps to explain it a lot better. And I created it at a time when I actually understood all of this a lot better. Than <laughs> <laughs> My memory's a little fuzzy yeah. on all hey, this most stuff. It's been a while. Wa watching your own tutorial is, is it's what we do. Yeah, totally. The amount of times I've rewatched my own UV unwrapping tutorial. Yeah. Or like that <laughs> once a year you have to do it. Uh, well, if you uh, can you track down the link to that uh, Cineversity tutorial, and I'll go track down the next question here. Sure. But just so people can go check it out. Um, let's see. Let's see. That's very specific to this. Uh, Nicholas is asking, how would we might make a dripping... A dripping drool effect, like a elastic liquid. So oh. you know, like kind of like that cartoony drip um, that comes that might come down. Uh, let's see. I'm gonna put us up on screen while you're searching, Rick, and then let's uh. Let's think about that. If you find a link, you just put that in Twitch. Sure. Um, if we're doing, uh, I, I kind of like that idea though. We can do like an elastic, cartoony drip, like uh, if a if a dog had a bunch of slobber or something. Um, what would be? Uh, I, I'm splitting your attention, but how would you go about doing that, Rick? Sorry, I'm gonna put this in Twitch, and then you have my attention. Okay. What cool. am I looking at? Okay. So first of all, yeah, there's the link, and I'll have that link in the show notes as well on YouTube when you're watching this on YouTube in the future. Ba ba, and oops, let me make sure that, that doesn't. Yeah, cool. Uh, okay, so uh, essentially, uh, like a cartoony drip, like if something like a dog, like a cartoony dog slobber, where there's like a big drop on the end of a line. Um, what would be what would you be your go-to for making something like that? Like, let's say we're going um, real cartoony, elastic, and springy. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I, one of the things I go to after watching uh, the success you had with the candle stuff last couple weeks or last week would, would be a, a rig kind of like that is, is actually creating sort of a dynamic rig, maybe with the soft body of clones connections. Oh yeah, and then uh, you could have a thicker object at the bottom, and then make the objects thinner as the drip goes up, so that you get some profile, and then put it into a volume object, maybe. Yeah, I like that. There'd be the full because my the the quick version that popped in my head would just be using hair dynamics, um, because you could very quickly do that, and I think that has like a pretty good elasticy rubberiness to it, and then you could just sweep a spline onto it and then thicken it up on the tip. But that spline doesn't have relative thickness. It's an absolute thickness throughout the entire spline. And it will inter interact with some colliders, some very specific hair body colliders, but it's not going to interact with other dynamic objects. It's not going to stick to it or be attracted to it in any kind of dynamic way. So if you build an entire chain of them, then you could directly control them very directly. Um yeah, and I think with the soft body springs, like those can break at a certain point, right? So you'd actually oh, yeah. be able to have the slobber like drool down and then break, and you see the drip. Actually, maybe yeah, we, 
we, we got to make this. And that's a really good point. That, that suddenly made it interesting enough where it's like, okay, we should make something now. Uh, and Travis, uh, we're just, we, there was no visual reference. We're just trying to make like a, like a, like in a cartoony dog slobbering. He's like, and there's like a big drip coming down. Um, and we just want to make a kind of big cartoony elastic drip. And that, could, that I think we can even make fall away and be blobbing into things. Uh, let's see. How do we want to try and divvy this up, Rick? Do you want to? start this one out or should i build the uh the chain and then you can take over once we get to the volume step what do you want to do uh why don't you start okay uh let's pop up my screen here okay here we are there's the previous question where we had the animated tail for anybody who might have just jumped in and then uh now let's open up a new file and let's start working on the elastic drip now uh, it's gonna. This is gonna be pretty low poly. It's not gonna be that many, but we could make more. I'm. I'm in. Oh, I've. I've been very inclined lately. Ever since I uh, started this technique, I've been very inclined lately to always work from uh, a cube whenever I can. If we're gonna be feeding it to a volume, then the cube is giving us tons of information. If we want to round it, we can always give it a single segment, and you know, make this sphere esque. And the really fun part here is. And I'll even show you, we were talking about this a little bit last week, but if I were to make a floor, let's make this a little more visual and let it place on the ground. I'm gonna make both of these dynamic objects, simulation, a rigid body. So you'll see if I play that this is a cube and you see it hits a floor and it stops and it behaves like a cube. But we can actually go into the, the dynamics tag and currently this is, the shape is set to automatic, which actually Rick, you might be able to clarify this is how it decides what the shape is because this is a cube and maybe it just automatically is hard coded to say hey you're a cube you are calculated as a box um because when we run the visualize on here i think if we hit alt v we can no uh control or command d and you go to dynamics you can go to visualize and enable this and we hit play and we see how it's visualizing the dynamics and you can see it's actually drawing a green box around it so it is being calculated as a box but so I, i'm just curious how it decides that but we can manually go into the dynamics of the cube and say okay you are a box but i want you to be calculated as an ellipsoid so pretty much as a sphere so when we hit play you can see that's actually got this low poly version of it but ignoring the visual of that you can see now that this cube is rolling as if it's a sphere. So that means it's going to calculate incredibly quickly. And I just through my own testing, it's my assumption that spheres calculate the quickest. But mathematically, it's just a radius. Like, am I colliding with this radius? Very simple math. The second quickest is going to be cube based because uh, calculating a box is really quick. Cylinders are probably also incredibly quick because these are mathematical objects. Yeah. Uh, so that's my assumption. So based on that, we can say, hey, this is going to calculate as fast as it possibly can because it's a cube. We'll round it out a little bit just to help us visualize the round effect. And the fong bugs me, so I'll delete the fong tag. Uh, so now let's start making a chain of these. We'll do this very cleanly. Um, I'm going to make a duplicate. I made it exactly 10 tall, so I can make a copy, move it up 10. And there's no, I've written, I wrote a script for myself and I have a tutorial about this. Actually, I did a SIGGRAPH presentation once about this. And I also did a, a recent presentation for automating this process. But uh, let's do this manually for anybody who's not too familiar. We're going to go into the simulate menu and grab a connector. So this is now a connector that we're going to connect between these two objects. I'm going to move up five units, so it's in between. And I want this to be a very free rotating connection. So I'm going to set it as a ball and socket. So this should be able, able to just freely connect from the first object to the second object. So just for, I guess for clarity, we should probably travel downward, not upward. So the second one, I'll say, which one's the original? That's at zero, zero, zero. So I'm going to move this down. I'm going to go negative just for us to be organized. So I, I like visually leaving these in between. So I'm going to set this to negative five. So with this connection, if I grab the top one and we name this one the base, I'm going to tell it dynamically, it is still dynamic, but it's not going anywhere. Dynamic is 
off. So now the second one is connected to the first one. You see it's not moving anywhere. I do want to make sure nothing moves. So all right, I want to make sure that uh, it doesn't turn off by accident. So we've got this deactivation value, which is really important because it will speed up your simulations. But for this case, I'm going to say I want it calculating all the time. So it will never deactivate with values of zero. So I'm going to play and we don't really see much. But if I were to move this, you're going to see that our second one is connected. and It's going to wiggle around. So I'm going to undo and reset back to zero. And now we're going to duplicate this uh, more time. So I'm going to put that as a child. Let's make a duplicate of that and scoot it down 10 units. I can hold down shift and automatically do that. And I need to make sure that this is connected from the parent to the child. And now I can grab both of those and make a double duplicate there. Move them down 20 units. Actually, uh, let me make sure this works. I'm going to grab the upper one because that's the only one that should need the new parent. And... Uh, link the parent and the child and let's see if it falls away or if it does sort of work also i'm going to create a turbulence right now just so we can see some motion forces turbulence set that to 55 which might be a lot but yeah okay those are connected but i think i yeah i think i did mess up a connection this is i'm glad this happened there's a very important thing with cinema and it's it's super logical why it does this uh, it, there's a bad connection happening right now and the reason for that is i took these two objects and i control copied them so what happened is it made a duplicate but with everything kind of still existing in the scene so this connector didn't do a relative connection to the previous cube it's still connected to what it was originally but we can get around that really easily by selecting those two objects and instead of control dragging just copy paste because now it's been copied to the clipboard and then pasted back in. So all of those relative, all those like references that they had to each other are broken and they're only related to each other, which means this time when I click on uh, this connector, hopefully we'll see that it is connected to two and three, where before it was probably on two and cube. So with that in mind, we only have to fix the top connector. Now, the good news here is every time we do this, it's going to get quicker and quicker. So let's hit play, make sure the connections look better than last time. And they do. Let's do it again. And I'm wondering, time... Chris, ultimately, though, if we want, before you go too much further, I'm wondering if we want springs so that we can <sighs> break them off oh, and have them stretch. Yes. That is a excellent, excellent point. I'm glad you stopped me because I would have gone all the way and been like, wait a minute, we should have been building springs. <laughs> um, and in fact, I don't, even want... yeah, I, don't even, I don't even think we want connectors, to tell you the truth. We just want springs. So yep, Yeah, in fact, I'm wondering down. if we can use the rigid body, uh, the, the dynamics... Uh, soft body made of clones. Oh, yeah. Does that that will make the connections, but could we scale them? Um, and and we can't. Oh, wait, there is a there's a break. There's the stretch. elastic limit. Yeah. Um, that's true. That is true. Um, hmm. Hmm, there's a lot of different paths to take on this one. Um, I would actually, um, I would. Would you like to demo the uh, the mo the mo dynamic version? Sure. Let's let's because, give it a shot. Yeah. Uh, bec I, I want to stress the reason I want to do this is. Um, Mention this is because I was really, really late to the party when it came to mo dynamics. Mo dynamics actually came out half a version before regular dynamics, I think, mm -hmm. and. I ignored these because, like, okay, that's just, it's a very, it's a very basic tool. It doesn't do that much, but you can actually do some incredible things if you use mode dynamics. And I've only ever talked about it a couple of times. So let's let Rick steer from here. Yeah. So I've just got a simple linear clone here on a cube and I'm cloning downward. And uh, let's go ahead and add a step effector just so that they can get a little bit bigger each time. And I like to, make this just a linear spline usually um but we probably don't want it to be quite so much maybe like that and uh then we'll go ahead and add a rigid body or uh soft body tag to this and we want to switch the soft body here from made as polygon lines to made of clones and then like chris was doing before we want to make sure individual elements is all we'll go ahead and set this to ellipsoid and then I'm trying to figure out the best way to connect it to, we may would just want to use a connector for the. 
First well, one. Can, can't you just put a MoGraph selection and make some of them not dynamic? Yes, that's a good call. Which, which, so, is, what, which is one of the things that's super amazing with MoDynamics. You guys know I, can, I, 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 I'm frustrated all the time that soft bodies are so amazing, but it doesn't have like the belting options that we have with cloth. But it's kind of like with MoDynamics, you do. So... Right. So I just I selected with the MoGraph selection, I'm selecting the, the bottom three here and that should. Yeah. So now those are the dynamic ones. And now if we take the cloner, I'm just curious, can we just animate this? I don't I'm not 100 percent sure. Maybe change the time. Uh, yeah. Alt alt drag to change the time, guys. Alt dragging makes it so it doesn't refresh the viewport. Yeah, look at that. Automatically yeah, dynamic there we go. and it's it's essentially belted and they should automatically be connected. And then it's just a matter of going in here to the soft body and we can do things like adjust the uh, elastic limit or the stiffness. Let's see here. Elastic limit. If we bring this down a lot, they should will they break, I wonder? I don't know. Go to zero. Uh, well, that's going to make them just fall apart. Zero structure means there's no springiness between them, so it's a full break. But is there a breaking point? Well, I, but we, uh, what we could probably do is... Oh, animate... look at that. I, huh. I, I'm seeing something huh. start to happen there. What is happening? I think it may just be the dampening or the, the lack of dampening. Hmm. But I mean, it's like they're breaking, but they're not fully breaking. Yeah, that's interesting. Uh, a thought I had would just be using fields and changing the MoGraph selection. So at a certain moment, it could be like, oh, I'm not dynamic. I guess I would turn it off. Hmm. There is a way of breaking them, I thought. Um. Well, before we worry about breaking them, uh, show show how easy it is uh, to like get a whole chain of these. Yeah, so we can just increase the clone count here. And let's let's do this too. Let's add some wind. Maybe you need a fall off. Oh, oh, your selection tag, your new clones might be static. Oh, uh, right. Good call. So, MoGraph selection. Yes, they aren't painted there. I wonder if it would be worth turning on fields and, and setting it to, like, everything above a certain point or something to automatically update that. Yeah, let's do that. Let's... Uh... Use fields, and we'll clear that. And let's just uh, let's actually just uh, use a formula field, and we can oh. just use uh, ID if ID equals zero or ID less than one. That should just grab the first clone. Yeah. Except, do we need the inverse of that? You could just make a. I guess oh, it could be ID yeah. does not equal one. Yes, that we need the inverse. You're right. So ID greater than one. Yeah. There we go. Nice. Then we'll go back here I and. I never thought we'll to add... use greater than one or greater than or less than in there. Now, in this case, we're just using these in a two-dimensional or in like an align way, but you can also make like a whole blanket out of these and it's oh, they're pretty good and they calculate really quick. Yeah, yeah. There's a weird almost drift on it. But that, that could be the wind. Or no, you got rid of the wind. I got rid of the wind. I think it's just the sort of the randomness of dynamics. And actually, the first two, 
this is important to realize. The first two are actually not dynamic right now. So we need to be ID equals greater than zero is greater than zero because oh, yeah. uh, MoGraph zero based for the indexes. So that means the first one is zero and then one, two, three, four, five. Uh, can you put a few extra frames on here so we can see the uh, overlap when it reaches the end? And then the cool thing here, too, is that we could actually put colliders in here that it's going to interact with. So we could go in here and just put a, uh, where'd it go? Put a, whoop. I meant to do a collider. <laughs> Oh, doesn't click. Bonk. There you go. <laughs> um, but yeah, if you put a little less, I'm curious. Uh, you want to take question. over from here? Uh, maybe. Yeah. If yeah, let's try doing a Dropbox transfer. We haven't done that. Something I'm curious about is actually, uh, I just have no idea. Do you know how the Mo Dynamics decides what should be connected? I don't. Off the top of my head. Yeah, I've always been curious about that. <laughs> Slobber Rick, there you go. Uh, okay, well, that's uh, the Dropbox workflow is very nice. Um, let's see, just to see some... Okay, so that's moving. We're getting the leftover. The formula is working great. The step effector is controlling the scale, which is great. We can make those pretty big. What I'm curious about is if we also make that change the position. So as they get bigger, they'd have more room to move forward yeah um what am i doing wrong here they should move forward yeah they're gonna move forward you're more. still showing my screen by the way oh thank you i think ba, 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 ba. there we go sorry right screen there we go okay all i was doing was tweaking the uh, step effector so um what am i doing here maybe we need two step effectors one to do the scale and one to do the position so i'll do that uh, duplicate the step. I always like to rename it. That will be the position one. And inside the effectors, we do that. So now we'll have one that affects the position and one that affects the scale. And the reason for that is I think we kind of want the opposite to happen to one of them. So I'm trying to think of a clever way of inverting it. I can invert the spline, but can I do it that way. I have a very specific reason for wanting to invert it that way because I want to control it. Uh, what am I doing wrong here? I want each one, if it's going to scale more, it should move further down is what I'm doing. If it's moving down, if it's scaling up, it should move more down. That's moving up, so that's moving more down, but they're all moving. The step is... Nice and linear. I mean, it is doing it. Oh, it's, yeah. It's, it's maybe you actually want a curve it. in this case. Because the smaller ones are. Yeah. Oh, yeah. We're definitely going to be able to art direct the drip because this is going to remap to all of them. And this is actually interesting. Oh, this is super interesting because as I add more in the count, they're moving up more. Yeah, I'm getting a little sloppy here but now we should be able to move these down get some reasonable distance are these actually colliding with each other as dynamic yeah they do seem to and it suddenly explodes why does it break up there are they getting too heavy i'm curious if they I, are I, I feel like they are i think that's what's happening here i'm gonna give them a custom mass of a zero Let's see if that does anything well it's different uh yeah it's interesting it's different than your basic chain I'm just resetting some values back to default to see what we get out of the box. Well, it's connected now. I mean, the elastic limit seemed to do something. It was stretching a little bit too much at one point. So these do seem to ignore their direct connection. I don't know if they ignore each other all the way up. But uh, as we make this, we are easily able to make this chain, the step effector, we can art direct the drip shape by saying it should scale more. We have it scaled down at the very tip. And it could be larger here, but it should wait a while before it suddenly gets really big near the end. Making these changes not at the time of zero can be weird. Now let's change the position is strange, so I'm going to go easy on that. Or just turn it off. 
and we'll have them go negative. So there we go. Now, if they're ignoring each other, then pretty much that's just our shape. Uh, they do seem to separate out a little bit. I'm not sure. I'd have to, I, I don't play with these enough. Maybe that elastic limit was doing it, but do you see, uh, I guess the thing that's throwing me off is this, uh, do you see how this is getting ahead? The curve goes further ahead. That's, that's a, yeah. a little strange to me. Uh, but based on some of my tests in soft bodies, nope, still happens. Uh, I found that that stuff happens in the uh, damping can cause that. But I just noticed there's a special setting that has appeared, which is tear out length. So that's actually what we wanted to be using. Um, but I do agree that stuff like the, the follow position can follow position and all this damping can introduce those kind of uh, overlaps but it doesn't seem to be turning i don't know it's kind of weird where it suddenly accelerates could be some sort of feedback loop in here and the point being is it doesn't feel like it's behaving exactly as if we were putting a bunch of connectors between them mm -hmm. but of course these aren't connectors these are probably using more like the soft body springs aren't they yeah yeah that's what it is um, so here's a tear out length so if it stretches more than 200 percent, it'll probably break yep so it snaps right away there Boink. Um, so if we lengthen this up a little bit, then it doesn't quite stretch 500 units there. So I bet you if we were to try and chop this thing, like with this, I can make this a dynamic object. Let's see if I can just go chop. Nope. It's not, that's not forcing it far enough away. I can't break it like that <laughs> by, uh, you know, if we had a wedge shape that might work, but right now it's just cutting yeah. through. So cutting through doesn't do it, but pulling it away that little bit would. Um, but even having said all that, the, um, is there, the tear out length has a, a map that we can feed it. Mm -hmm. So can we feed it a, uh, a, a mo, mo graph weight tag? Is that what it can be fed? I'm not sure to be honest with you. Let's see. Let's find out. Uh, okay. So we got a MoGraph weight tag. Oh, no, it doesn't accept no. it. No, it doesn't accept it at all. Um, that's too bad. Um, so, so if we're basing it on clones, a ma the map's not really helpful in this case. That's Yeah. It's, it's interesting that it has a map. Well, it's for when you're doing a, a mesh-based soft body. So you can oh, have okay. certain parts of the mesh be more or less of each parameter. But you can, you can do a soft body made of clones. No, no, like a, 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 not uh, like a mesh. The, the map, the map parameter probably should just disappear when the soft body is made of clones. Okay, but it's when the soft body isn't made of clones. Yeah, interesting. I'm just trying to think of some way we could break that connection because, uh, besides what we just did, because. Here's our, our selection, and that's what's dynamic or what's not dynamic, but it's not tear parameter. That's not going to separate them. Mm -hmm. So it's just the only thing I can think of would be this tear out. We could feed a vertex map, but a vertex map is meaningless on this type of model. Right. No, I mean, I think our best bet is to, is to do what you were doing, but maybe do it with like a wedge shape instead of a plane. Because the plane, the problem is that it, the dynamics are only happening on the the plane side it's you know it doesn't have any thickness so. yeah now having said all that besides this little curve we're getting which i'm still not quite sure what's causing that but the uh this drip and rubberiness is really great like that's and these are all the default settings i got rid of the damping from everything but if we were to change the structural then we could have them tighten up a lot more the more structural the more these are not going to want to be stretchy and with no damping, that means it's really rubbery. If we put a lot of damping, that's going to drain the energy out from the system really quickly, and it won't be nearly as springy. And the lower that is, the, the more it can stretch. Now, having said all that, um, what's neat about this system is we are really easily able to shape this and that this really is, these do have this depth to them. At least I'm hoping they do. I'm going to give ourselves a little bit more, a few more frames. You'll see that this is colliding with these thin ones here but it's colliding with the fat ones down here. So dynamically speaking, this is this is a pretty robust series of connections. So where this gets interesting is if we were to throw this right now directly into a volume, it wouldn't work very well because you're gonna see we have all this separation between all of our different clones here. But what I think I hope we should be able to do really easily is 
create a tracer object, and I've been doing this a lot lately, is by creating a tracer with the cloner, if I say connect all elements, or maybe it's connect all objects, there uh, is, you can now see that we get the line interconnecting every single one of them. So instead of running the volume on, uh, and let's have that calculate afterward, uh, instead of running this, the volume stuff directly on each of these clones, we can do it on the tracer because they're all interconnected. And just uh, we could do the line and give the line thickness in that. But if we want to visualize this even more, of course, this would stop us from doing the, doing the break. But let's just say we're not doing the break here. Uh, we can sweep it, of course. So creating a end side so we can control exactly how many sides there are. And a sweep, drop that as a child, drop the tracer as a second child. P for scale, scale this down. And now I'm gonna control, I make it as fat as the fattest point of all of our clones. And then via our scale, and we could use like Expresso or set driver set driven to make this arc completely match the arc inside of our step effector. But I'm just gonna eyeball it. So it's definitely gonna arc up here and then get thinner at the end and let's scoot this more here so we get that drip shape there you go something like that so now we've got oh yeah and this pulls down a little bit there we go get the nice drip shape so now we can get this goopier looking drip and oh it uh that was weird it wasn't refreshing right away hmm. the tracer doesn't seem to like Acknowledging the mode dynamics until it's no, oh, it's oh, that's interesting. Let me think hmm. of what might be the cause of this. Uh, what might be the cause? I'm gonna turn off the deactivation, but I don't think that's gonna be it. That does suddenly. It's not doing it while it's keyframed. As soon as it stops being keyframed, let's see if it changes if it collides earlier as well. No, it seems to. Oh, it doesn't like the keyframes. As soon as it's not keyframed, it's suddenly working. But that's uh, that's odd. Yeah, it's too bad. The, the tracer is one of those things where it's like it doesn't. The order of operations. I, I really wish we could expose the order of operations on the. Tracer. Try connect all elements instead of connect all objects on the tracer. I don't think it even showed it, but let's see. Oh, okay. Um, connect element. Connect all object. Connect elements. No. Yeah. Hmm connect all objects once it's not moving it's suddenly fine but it doesn't like moving interesting um i can't think of you know anything. the the if we go back to to doing it with volumes the cool thing would be we could actually randomize the 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 cube size a little bit so you could get like glob globby parts not just at the end but get them like in the middle too Yes. Uh, I just I want to be able to connect those. We'd have, to, we'd have to start feeding a lot more. I'm going to turn off the tracer temporarily. But if we make the volume, if this starts stretching really far apart, there, there's no way those are going to blob into each other. Yeah. Um, so that's going to turn into we need these to be potentially more structural. incredibly structural. 500 structure. So these should get really stuck to each other. And then... Um, they get, we're losing a lot of our distance and they, they still might actually get reasonably stretchy if we just make more of them. So we'll just increase that. So now maybe there's enough distance between them to be able to do it. Um, but, uh, yeah, what do you mean by the randomness in them? I'm going to go ahead and save this. Just, so you just like, take, okay. Yeah, you, you take over again. So sure. B. And I'll remember to switch the screen this time. Save and back to Rick. <laughs> um so i was just thinking if you go in and you add a random effector and we'll turn off position but turn up scale and maybe this is well we can just make it one and then we'll just bring this the strength down oh that's, uh, really, that's really straightforward i was thinking way more complex and then so so you're going to get some more globbies um and actually, what I might do instead of using a random effector is do a plane effector and then use a random 
field because then That's we favorite. could actually use the noise to art direct it a little bit more. Oh, yeah. I was telling the story the other day of uh, when the first version of OGRAF came out, there was no plane effector. Which, yeah. When you think about it today, is insane. And back then, everybody was taking a shader effector and feeding it like a, just a white material. And that was the plane effector. It was like, why would anybody need a plane effector? But once you add in the idea of fall offs and. Uh, totally. And fields. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and it's actually like, other than the fact that the random effector can go in all three directions individually, yes. that's really the only reason why the random effector needs to be around anymore. You can just use a plane effector. Yeah. Otherwise, you have to replace it with three plane effectors. Yeah. Uh, do I do the volume stuff here? Sure. Although Let's it's go ahead. Let's do a pseudo explode, or it's uh, oh, I guess they're all spinning, so we have to think about it in a uniform way. But so let's bring this down to like six, and smoothing's gonna be oh yeah. Um, yeah, smooth will obliterate things, so we're gonna have to go super easy on it. Yeah. Yeah, I tend to like using uh, the smoothing deformer to do like a post smooth rather than this when you yeah. have to. I should, yeah. Uh oh, it doesn't like the refreshing on there either. It doesn't like the keyframe, which is interesting. That is really interesting. Hmm. I have to think about that. It might be what if we that. what if we do it this way instead? Does that It probably will have to be baked to uh, fully acknowledge it. And sometimes you have to even go to a lemic before it will acknowledge it. Like the the candle thing didn't like I also just wonder if we remove the keyframes here. Oh, I guess I got it. Um, and then just uh, keyframe it here instead. I'm just curious if, it, like, any time it's being keyframed, it won't. Yeah, it's not acknowledging any time it's being keyframed. And as soon as you're off the track, then it's like, okay, now I will. Now I can refresh. So it's causing some sort of feedback loop in the refresh, I think. Yeah. Trying to think about the priorities and think about why that would be happening. Yeah, we could totally, yeah, baking the dynamics, uh, keyframe it within the cloner. That's an interesting idea. I also, I, I'm also curious if the field might be breaking it because we're feeding it through a field instead of its set original selection. And maybe as it's refreshing, it like that field doesn't go. There's a lot of different things that could be, could be variables on that. I also just, good thing to check is just make sure that we don't have anything that we don't realize is keyframed. No. <laughs> um, yeah. Follow position. I mean, well, I, that's a interesting, a couple of people in the chat are saying they're trying to think of ways around using keyframes, like you know, using a constraint tag on it or a follow position. Um, I, I would, I, my guess is anything that's causing it to refresh, it's not going to like. Not specifically keyframes. In this case, keyframes is what's causing it, but I don't think it's limited mm -hmm. to keyframes, would be my guess. Um, yeah, interesting. The uh, Somebody posted in, in chat, I, I guess some uh, Everfresh on Twitter had done this using spline dynamics. Um, so this is... I, I think the advantage this has is... Well, you could still do it if you cloned on the spline. You could do a mix of the, of the techniques if you cloned onto the spline. But, you know, I, I actually kind of like the idea of being able to sort of vary the width at spots with this. Well, dynamically do it. I mean, a lot of it does go back to, like, I really enjoy the uh, the, mo, the mo dynamics being able to mm -hmm. do their thing. But if we went back to the original original technique of these just being dynamic uh, dynamic objects linked by springs or by connectors, then it would just be working. Like that, right. that does just straight up work. So we went with the more iterative method, but it's probably ultimately the one that works, won't work quite as well. 
uh, for this case, because we're trying to push it further. And once once we're using connectors and whatnot, you could just break any connector you want at any given point. Right. Um, so yeah, yeah. So yeah, Everfresh does it, and uh, uh, somebody put the link in Twitch for if anybody wants to check out what somebody might have done with that version of it. Uh, but I would like to get to more questions. We're kind of getting to the meandering point on this one, so let's uh, yeah, let's see what it is. Yeah, I do agree. We could, uh, yeah, I tried moving the ball so that wouldn't refresh it, and Chop is saying, "Well, if it was baked, I think it would probably work if it's baked, and if that didn't work, it would work if it was." Uh, alembic baked that almost always will force it to go uh, but in any case uh, i'm gonna scroll around find another question in here somebody i know somebody really likes a question that level bubble asked and they've been re even re-asking it do you want to switch back to your screen uh yeah before i forget thanks uh smeka's in the house hello andrew is here now pro tools dean uh sky hello uh got lots of people hanging out meeks um sorry i'm trying to find the question that people are reposting okay dean reposted so uh best approach to texturing both sides of a cloth surface with thickness oh, that's an interesting question so if you were to be running like a soft body sim and then you use cloth to create thickness is there a way of texturing one side differently than the other side? Uh, that's a good question. That's I'm not good sure question. I have an answer. I have I have one thought that immediately pops into my head, and I don't know if it'll work, but super quick to test. So here I have a plane in cinema, um, and I'm going to create a selection tag. So now there's a selection tag on everything there. So that's only that current geometry. So if I had to create a cloth surface and feed this in, it is now creating new geometry. All of this is like an extrude, which would not be part of the same selection. So based on that theory, if we make two materials, make one of them blue, leave the other one white, and I apply both of them, and now I take the secondary material and limit it to the polygon selection. No, it didn't work. That's kind of all I had. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm wondering if we could do it with fields somehow. Fields. I mean, the, the trick here is we can't make the cloth editable. If we make the cloth editable, it ceases to be the cloth surface. So it, that's the limiter. And can fields affect the texture on something that hasn't been made editable? That's my question. Uh, ba, 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 ba. <sighs> A correction deformer. Am I misunderstanding? Yeah, I could see a correction deformer working. Oh, wait, 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 but this is about textures. Why would a correction deformer work? Well, you could you could use a correction deformer to set the selection, theoretically. But uh, but that's point selection. It's not poly selection, right? Correction deformer is only points. Or is it also polys? <gasps> is it also polys? And I never realized. Let's find out. Set selection, and then, well, that, that creates a selection, but we can't still limit to that. That's creating the selection. I don't, well, first of all, if, the, if you can do polygon selections in a correction deformer, I had no idea you could do that. So that's really cool. That's neat. I have to <laughs> think about that, because that might have some really neat applications. We taught Chris something. <laughs> I had no idea. I'm assuming then it also has edges. I thought it was only points. And this thing's been around forever. <laughs> I, I, I use a correction to form all the time. You can trick like MoGraph in a bunch of ways. If it do, if it will not ex acknowledge a mesh, you can say, well, here's a correction to form. It's like, oh, okay, I'll acknowledge that. Um, so that actually has some neat implications. But this selection only exists on the correction deformer we're not texturing the correction we're texturing the cloth surface so yeah and i thought maybe you could just copy the selection up but it doesn't work yeah and even i mean because it doesn't it won't transfer to a live object so even if we made this field i'm going to take this and make this field driven and that's field-driven, drag in the selection tag of the correction deformer. 
to transfer that as a polygon selection, even that, I don't think, yeah, that's not going to have any effect because it, it, it has to be editable. All these things we're doing would work if we made it editable. Um, so it just goes to cloth isn't going to let you do that. Now, cloth is not technically the only way of adding thickness in cinema. What are some other ways? Um, parametric -y ways. I mean, there is the, uh, isn't there a Cineversity like parametric extrude? Uh, yeah. Well, there's the solidify. There's actually a, on Maxon Labs, there's a solidify uh, tool, a uh, plugin. Uh, I'm not sure if that allows this or not. Uh, unfortunately, the, I was going to also suggest well, the bevel tool. You can kind of do a parametric bevel with the bevel to or uh, extrude with a bevel as well. So he, I've got this weird thought, which is, uh, ba, 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 ba. I want to make it dynamic because essentially this is a question for when it gets dynamic. So I'm going to make the sphere a collider body. We'll make the plane a soft body. Now you can't. Does it like an inst? I'm going to make an instance of this, and does an instance even work? I'm going to hide the original. Yeah, it just, oh, wait, you can't hide the original. You have to put it into a null and hide the null. Does that still run? Yeah, see, it doesn't move with it. Um, now that moves. Can we, could we trick this? This would be weird. I'm gonna, I've never done this. Uh, I'm going to try putting a rigging, a constraint tag and lock this to the PSR also of the dynamic object. It's a little bit weird, but would that actually move it in the same way? Huh, it kind of seems to. That's interesting. Now, uh, let's get rid of a bunch of the shear and the flexion. It's so low poly that uh, it's not very floppy. Now, let's see. Okay, if we unhide it, are there actually two? Yes, there are two. One is lagging a frame behind. Uh, this should calculate after, and we might need it to calculate way after, like after the generator level. And even that, it might not do it as an instance. But for the sake of the experiment, it might render correctly. So let's just keep that in mind. I'm going to leave the rest of it default. So that is following. It is fully dynamic. First of all, I've never done that before. I've never gotten an instance of a soft body working. So if you instance it and tell it to follow the position, it does seem to work, which is cool. But here's the thought is if we take the instance and I put the bevel on there, and I'm going to say I want to do a polygon bevel. You can see it's actually extruding it upward. So uh, if I just extrude that, you know, uh, that's one offset. Let's set that offset to zero. Okay, you can't do zero. I forgot. So we'll do 0 0.001. So now it's doing a very tiny inner offset, so not visible. But we can extrude this as much as we want. So now it's a separate kind of extrusion. Like, But these are not two separate objects entirely. So I could texture one and texture the other. And now you see they, they two do have two different textures and they're both doing the same movement. So that should sort of work as well. The last step would be creating a connect object and feeding both of those into the connect. And the connect should maintain the materials. Uh, it's gonna mess up the fong. So I'm gonna set that to manual and make sure that it's using the same fong. Now, uh, the question here is, can we get this to, I mean, I think it would automatically work if we baked it. Actually, oh, look, it automatically worked. The connect seems to have uh, fixed it instantly. It's refreshing properly. So look at that. Now we've got, uh, yeah, there we go, solved. Actually, this is pretty neat. It's a good method where I was trying to think of an alternative to using the soft body, but now we're using an instant separate object. We do whatever we want in completely different ways. That gives us a lot of power um, to be able to do that. And I, I do use bevels to do these fakey extrudes um, in other circumstances. And what's cool is even you know, we could push that further um, you know, right now we are just doing a bevel of uh, a tiny bevel, but we could actually have that push inward and that should continue to work. And even along those lines, if we made a, uh, a second bevel, if I make this a child, not of the plane, but the null, and we extrude this negative, then I think we could probably get an inverse extrude on the other side. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's just kind of a post effect that's happening after everything. Oh, I guess that's not going to cause a refresh. That might need to go to a connect object now to be acknowledged. But there's a lot of interesting ways that that might combine. And that's pretty neat. It's clean. It's clean. It's logical. And it's even refreshing properly in the viewport. So, yeah, I just learned a couple things there. That's a really neat one.
Yeah, I like I, I like those simple questions where we're suddenly it's like, hey, we just learned a bunch of things about cinema that we didn't know before. The ramifications. So what do we get? Let's get. Uh, <laughs> let's save this one and uh, cloth. Uh, extrude. Texture trick. Andrew had some questions about Python. Uh, there's some great uh, tutorials on Cineversity about how to do some stuff with Python. So I'd suggest that uh, he checks those out. Um, yeah, the uh, I, I don't know much about the data types and anything. I mean, I've only ever kind of coded in Cinema, so I don't have another baseline outside of it. Uh, I've always found Python to be pretty intuitive. Although something important to note is, isn't it essentially that Python's implementation in Cinema is effectively... For all purposes, it's like it was it's a C plus plus plugin that's like interfacing between the two, right? Yeah, for all intents and purposes. And it's it's also mirroring the C plus plus API. So um some of the way that the data types work and everything uh is basically set up maybe in a more max on C plus plus API way than a Pythonic way. But the cool thing about that is that if you develop a plugin in Python or a script in Python, it's easier to translate that into a C++ plugin once you need more performance or whatever. Yeah. And there's a lot of places where you hit the wall in Python. It's like, oh, I want to do this. It's like, oh, you can go up to this point. But then after that, Python couldn't do it. The implementation of Python couldn't do it. And you have to get the C++ because Cinema 4D is natively written in C++. Yeah, yeah. Most of the Cinema 4D features are actually developed first as plugins. So uh, the API is is even used by our developers to actually uh, make things happen. But uh, the, the, the Python API continues to improve more and more and more. And you really don't hit those walls nearly as much. It's really just when you need extra performance that, that you hit the wall these days. Excellent. Uh, we got a couple people wanting this question. So let's see what we get here. It's another Instagram link. So this one from Travis. Uh oh, looks crazy. Uh, so this is from M H Sprod. Uh, so let's see what we got. I gotta turn off the audio. Whoa, look at that. That's cool looking. Let's see what we got. Oh, there's a bunch of them. So. Uh, okay. Which one are we looking yeah, at? Yeah, that, that, this goes <laughs> once again. Travis, this is oh, uh, he he just I think he likes all of it, but he also says bubble effect, assuming that means the first one. Blip, 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 blip. Well, the okay. the one that's on the the it's coming up. Um, that one bubble effect is that one. That looks a lot like something that you did in one of your earlier episodes this season. The soft bodies. We're trying to. I don't know about that. Like any technique I've done, because I don't know how I would approach this. I mean, and we could potentially assume that this technique is very similar to what's happening here. Not necessarily. Mm -hmm. Like there might be. Honestly, actually, look, I mean, I'm almost more feeling that these might just be refractive spheres being cloned out to the surface. Like I'm not really feeling. Uh... They're just they're just growing in scale, and then there may be a little bit of dynamics to keep them from colliding. They, they, um, there does seem to be a soft bodiness. Some of them are squishy oh, yeah. around, but these do just seem to be soft body spheres growing on the surface, and then they're just a really cool refractive material that's seeing through it. You can actually see if you kind of frame by frame that this is not that material stretched. It's actually a refraction potentially of that material. Um, but it's a very stylized refraction. So I'm wondering if that is like a refraction that's ignoring the material and it's just looking at the sky type of thing. Uh, but it's really convincing that this is like the surface inflating. It's crazy that this effect and this effect, this this one, they look so similar. And I think they're done in completely unrelated ways. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, I think that these might just be soft bodies growing... Yeah, it's really cool. I mean, it, it has a, another uh, Zachary Corzine type of vibe where it feels like we're morphing from one shape to another. And the way that they're kind of bushled up really, you know, the artistic direction on this is gorgeous. Yeah, I really like that. Um, 
I'm looking at the separation here. I'm trying to think of... Can we do a basic version of this? Just like essentially the growth effect? Would that be something that sounds interesting to you, Rick? Uh, sure. But then we also had this one, which is also sub sort of the bubble effect. And... Uh, <sighs> Like I'm curious, I'm curious a couple of levels because if you look here, do you see this? We, we've got geometry here, so it's like we've got these potentially rigid parts and soft parts. So okay, that's that's a potentially a thing, but I, I don't know how I would go about doing this because it's like you'd have to. Each of these would need. You could increase your rest length, so like maybe this interior geometry and the exterior geometry are actually physically separate models. Um, I, well, for, uh, this is for cinema purposes because I think this said it might have been done in Houdini. They said the one in the circle was done in Houdini. Yeah. I mean, First of all, a, let's credit uh, who did the. Yeah, or, oh, is, uh, it's M. H. Broad. I said. But there's multiple, oh, there's multiple um, references multiple down there. Oh yeah, yeah. Oh man, a bunch of their screen names here. Well, I'll, I'll be linking this directly. But yeah. yeah, first creation. So, oh man, can you pronounce any of these names? There's so many of them. Well, that oh, wait, is oh, love. People on love different ones. Yeah. <laughs> Lavrinal. Maxime Hecquard, maybe. Enzo Crema. Maxime, yeah, again. Quentin. Was that French? Yeah, I'm not even going to try that one. <laughs> well, a lot of people are involved here, but yeah, there's a lot of gorgeous sequences all over the place here. That uh, what, that that one in the circle that we were just on, it, you know, the beginning of that makes me think of like a collision deformer type of a thing, but you, it won't be able to hold up as you make them bigger. So I'm yeah, wondering if there's only, like a transition you could cheat there or something. The only thing that could do this is soft bodies. So then it goes to if if we locked. They'd have to be locked on the edges, and there's no way to lock edge. Well, you'd have to very manually lock the edges. We actually found out in the bonus stream that you could actually use a series of springs essentially as a belt tag, and we actually got it working way better than I thought we would. But yeah, you know, we'd have to create a thousand springs to do all these little interconnections to lock those, and then you could animate the rest length animating up or animate a vertex map, but they wouldn't be stuck in that particular position. And that to me is the tricky part here. Um, but soft bodies would be the only thing that could do these really nice collisions on top of each other. Yeah, which is yeah. to me the impressive part of this one. Um, so I, I can think of how to make these cell shapes. I could think of how to inflate them. They would collide really nicely. You could use a connect object to have the static and the not and, and the animated become a single mesh. But how do you stick them to the edges? That's that's the tricky part. Unless that'd be crazy. Uh, I, I want to do a, a quick, if you'll indulge me for a moment here, Rick. Yeah. Um, I want to do a micro test of this and just see if the if the if the theory is good. So let's see. Once again, let's get some materials to distinguish here. I'm going to actually move a floor slightly downward. And then we've got this plane. We're going to make it higher poly, but we don't want to go crazy. So let's do uh, 50 by 50. I think we should be able to handle that. I'll do 40 by 40. Got to be careful when you're live streaming. And then here's the thought is <sighs> trapping it, uh, dropping a, a different object on it. So um, What's a quick way of doing this? I'm gonna make a second shape here, set it to three by three, make this editable. I'm just gonna eyeball this, but I'm gonna hit MO, the slide tool, and slide some of these around and just get a couple of varied little shapes going here. Not quite square. So nothing crazy there. So now I select all those, I for inner extrude, uh, turn off preserve groups, and do something like that. So that is now a completely separate model and if we give this a lot of weight and drop it, we can, instead of binding everything, we'll just physically pin it down. So let's see, simulation, mm -hmm. collider body on the floor. This one will be a soft body. 
And then this will be a collider. Well, uh, I guess it could also just be a collider body. So it can't even move. Yeah, that's probably the best idea. So if we move this down, this is going to get potentially messy. Uh, now, uh, in the end, I don't think we'd actually be viewing that mesh, but I'm going to leave it there for now. And let's make it very clear what we're seeing by making a second material, make a nice green on there. So here's a thought. That soft body is dynamically just going to fall to the ground. That's fine. This is a collider body. It can't go anywhere. If we were to create a wind, yeah, this, this might work. Let's create a wind and have the wind blow upward and set that to 55, which is a, a number in which we'll very obviously see the effect. So now you can see that we're getting a little bit mm -hmm. of inflation there. So if we start increasing that value, I don't want to go crazy. So let's keyframe it. I'm going to keyframe the wind speed here. And then as we slowly get to 55, I'm going to go up to 10 times the amount and see what that does. It might, uh, I'm going to save this is a dangerous test. <laughs> Not that we spent that much time on it, but no reason to lose it. Uh, in full, uh, inflating soft body Chris uh, okay let's let that keyframe upward it should start inflating more and more and more this it's holding up pretty well so far I, I wouldn't be surprised if it slips through yeah some of those corners are going to slip through we can definitely get around that um we get I pin a couple of those corners we can shrink I'm going to just shrink the shape so there's a little bit of something on the edge for them so now here's where things maybe could get interesting for us is this is just this is just the wind doing this part of it. So if we let this pre-roll up to about frame 30, and then we go to our cloth here, at this frame, I'm now going to start animating our rest length. So let's go one more frame forward, keyframe rest length, and then over the course of eh, the wind still getting stronger and stronger. So I might stop the wind at that strength, but let's double our rest length over that time frame, I will go back to 30 and grab the wind. I'm going to say the wind should be that strength at this time, and I'm going to delete this keyframe. So we should get up to this point, and then the rest length will take over and start growing there. And then, uh, before I forget, I'm just going to grab all these tags and crank, get rid of all the bounce, and go crazy on the friction. So 222 on the friction. And let's see. So this should go up to about 30, and then it's suddenly going to start getting a lot more length, which is going to enable them to stretch. Maybe not so much inflate. Yeah, they're stretching. That's cool. But how do we get them to inflate? I would think that they need individual forces inside of each of them to be like pushing outward. But you yeah. don't really want them kind of affecting the local section. Um, tricky. Uh, I yeah, mean, I it... almost just wonder if we even just put like, could you put spheres inside of where each of those are going to come up, and then keyframe dynamics to be enabled after the, you know, it's going to be inflated enough. The only problem with that, it's is not going to be smooth though. Well, I think that would actually work pretty well. The problem would be. In once the spheres, one the big trick here that makes it look so cool is at the moment, at a certain moment, they intersect each other, and it's like this inflation of them pushing against each other, right? It, you know, these actually push against each other. And if there's spheres inside of them inflating, then those would start passing through the surfaces of the other spheres and the other neighbors, and then they would be pinched in between two places it couldn't go. So it would limit it there. But, I mean, in the same way you're saying we could do a couple of spheres there, I mean, there's no reason we couldn't um, here. Uh, Keyframe an attractor or something? Yeah, I'm just thinking we could clone. Yeah, we can clone it. We can clone an attractor. So I'm going to, I made a copy of this. I'm going to fill in these holes again. Fill in, fill in, fill in. Just because this is going to be the quickest way to get those and then hit UI, delete. Now we can clone onto the surface of this one and uh, clone, cloner, and then simulate. And we can use an attractor. Uh, 
I wonder if there's would be some trick with field forces that would work well here. But let's just try using an attractor for now. I'm going to clone onto an object. The object will be these clone object clone thing. I guess I clone at the polygon center. And the attractor, there's going to be a bunch of attractors and they need to fall off, which we should now be able to see get cloned. And uh, I guess, yeah, I do want it to get weaker near the edge. It should be bigger so they pass through each other. And if we are so inclined, we can enable scaling. So they're going to be a little bit more. The big ones will be bigger based on the polygon it currently is cloned onto. That's kind of something. I don't know if it'll work, but I do think that, well, I was surprised in certain conditions, uh, you can uh, clone forces, which is crazy to me, but you totally can. Uh, let's go negative 100 on the attraction. I'm going to really slow down our speed limit because we don't need it to go fast. Uh, now, immediately, these mites, they're pushing away. So I'm going to start with uh, these being lower. So I'm going to actually scoot this down. And let's just see what it looks like for the first few frames. I'm going to save again. And uh, actually, you know, I'd love to do it. Let's turn off the wind and just let the attractor do the work. So this is just the attractor pushing upwards. You can, can see it's doing something. So if we make the tractor a thousand, then it's now going to be pushing up a lot. And now I'm just going to, let's, we're just doing a, a, a little stress test here. I'm going to try scooting this up into the air so that they're uh, centered a little bit. And those, so those should start getting inflated outward. <laughs> it's pretty funky. They're definitely, you know, they're definitely getting a little bit more of an inflated vibe. Uh, hmm. Hmm, hmm, hmm. I mean, it's cool. It's not, I mean, we didn't, we could increase the stats per frame because some of these are passing through the hidden layer, but, oh man, how do we, I mean, are they just not big enough or is the wind just not strong enough here? There's a couple different attractor. It may just be a density thing. A polygon density thing that there's yeah. not enough. Yeah, we could increase the rest length some more. And yeah, I mean, I just I essentially want to see them push into each other, but there might be a limit on that because as these attractors pass through each other, they're going to cancel each other out for all purposes. So there might be a natural equilibrium here. Somebody on chat suggesting volume pressure. I don't know if that will do anything since it's not a volume. I wonder if we did make it a volume if that could do something that's a weird that's a weird dangerous thing to try but i'm down well let's that do that and then move on basil cmr1 just for credit yeah let's do that uh now it is gonna it's creating a lot of redundant polygons which is the slightly unfortunate part but it's worth a try so let's see what do we have i'm gonna temporarily turn off the attractors the tractor system and we need the trap to be above it then the cube needs it's i'm gonna go lower poly just because we're, we're we also have them on the side and we have them oop, we don't need those vertical ones we have them on the side and the bottom we could reduce the polys down there but let's just give it this test um just stealing the tag off of it turn off the original uh so that's gonna increase the rest length which is fine but you're also saying increase the pressure uh i kind of want to keyframe that up let's see if this works at all oh we need the wind back on and then the wind we might want to tell only affects certain vertex maps because this is actually going to be blowing oh how do we do this uh i don't want it to pull the bottom part up so we could make a linear fall off set to I always get the wrong, I'm going to say Z minus, but I probably have it backwards. And we set this really small. I'm going to set to one because sometimes you go to zero. Certain systems don't like it. Uh, ba -ba 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 -ba. Okay, so if I did this right, the top will move. But it didn't, so I think I got it backwards. Maybe. Z plus. Well, it was pushing up so okay i did get it backwards so the other wind should pretty much just be affecting the top so that wind should be pushing upward now once that wind goes up high enough we have to ignore the edges for now but once this wind goes up high enough could we um 
I, I don't want to ignore those edges that much. So I'm going to actually do a loop selection. I'm going to say select boundary edge. Oop, no, that still doesn't want to grab it. So I'm going to do a very quick selection here. Uh, I want edges, so let's go to a rectangle selection and do that, 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 and that. D for extrude, extrude outward there. That should chop it better. And now we hit play. Those should push up. And then we will keyframe. Okay, it's going to get nuts, but right around here, let's start increasing the pressure. Uh, pressure, I don't know how far we want to go, so I'm going to hold down Alt, jump up to frame 55, and do you know what the scale of pressure is here? I don't I, have an intuitive vibe. Do we want to I do don't like remember. 1, 10, 100? I, I feel like it's smallish. Right, yeah, I feel like 10, 10 pressure is a lot of pressure. All right, I'm going to go back to 30, so we should be able to continue from there. And now the pressure should start keyframing its way up. So it's going to pressure, pressure, pressure. I mean, it's doing something, but it's very uneven. But this, I don't know. That's that not unlike what it, what the what the source was doing, kind of. But it's not it's not closing the gaps right now. Yeah. Well, this one inflated nicely, but it doesn't feel like the pressure is being uniformly applied. Like it's almost like the pressure didn't do anything over here, but it's doing quite a bit here. Uh, and then uh, we're not seeing it because it's hidden below uh, this trap. A trap shape, but it also is probably inflating a lot on these sides as well. So mm -hmm. I, I just don't know the way the pressure algorithm works to be, see how it's applying in the situation. Uh, it's, I don't know. It's hard to tell. And then maybe 10, 10 seemed like a lot, but maybe, maybe 10, maybe we can go higher. I'm just going to manually do it, kill off the pressure and let's go up to 22. See if it explodes. See that one, two, those two are doing a lot. This one, that one seems, a couple of them seem to have a little bit, but some are being ignored. So I think pressure, the way pressure is calculated is a little more specific is a good idea. And maybe if these were a series of individual shapes, it could work. Mm -hmm. And I don't see any reason it couldn't be. You could totally uh, trap a bunch of uh, a bunch of them and create a surface on one side or another. Um, it's something to explore. Hit me up with that question maybe again next week when I'm by myself, and I might explore that some more. But let's try and jump onto something, especially something that we can have a guest more involved in. Trey is saying, what is wrong with this? Dynamics and dumping. What is wrong with this is an interesting question. What does that mean? Is it like your own Instagram? It is your own Instagram. I don't really do critique. I don't uh, feel qualified, but let's take a look. I mean, it's kind of a direct question of a project you're working on. So it's an, it's your only it's your own render. You're saying what's wrong with it? Um, I mean, you get nice twitchy cans. It, you put a glitchy thing on top of it to try and make it look wrong. Um, but it, it, based on what you're saying. It's not supposed to be glitchy. Yeah, I'm trying to figure out what it should be doing. Uh, what is wrong with this dynamics? Dumping objects out of the box through an emitter infinitely. So, okay, he's he's emitting objects dynamically, and they're and and it's twitching around. Is that? Uh, I mean, it's also calculating so fast. Like it feels like you're at ten times speed. There's a it lot was of movement. constantly glitchy and quick like that. I'm just wondering if it's a scene scale issue. Uh, do you want to build a, a version of that, Rick? Just some cylinders. Sure. All right, jumping back on your screen. I mean, it's a fun dynamics question, so it doesn't. Yeah, for yeah. Good stream so, content. and and it fits me. Although I'm going to change the Diet Coke to Diet or the Diet Pepsi to Diet Coke. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but if we were to do something like this for our box. And we'll just kill that edge. And then we'll create an emitter. See, I haven't even learned where everything moved to. You can find it in the simulate menu, at least. I don't go. think it's in a, one of those buttons. Um, and we'll just move this up 
in here. Close enough. And we'll, I mean, really, you don't need, you don't need MoGraph or Dynamics for this. You could just, no, because they need to collide with each other. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, we'll take our cylinders. Um, obviously, they need to be smaller. Oh, that's three of them already. There we go. We could, you're going to clone onto the particles, or would you just apply the mm, dynamics directly to the particles? Yeah, I guess you really don't need the... Yeah, exactly. You could just do... Well, you, what's cool is you get a lot of control from the clones, and I think that workflow would totally work. Yeah, and I, I'm partly I was just trying to to show that workflow, so we can just yeah, go into no, object yeah, you keep it and emitter, and um, we'll want to add a simulation rigid body to this. Well, I want to add a simulation rigid body to the floor. I always tell people to add color to things, and then I always forget to do it myself. <laughs> so we'll do that and we'll go in here and we'll do this and just make it okay oh, and we need to make the box needs to be static mesh yes so we'll copy this and off static mesh The emitter's a little far back, so they're sneaking <laughs> out the back. Let's see what's going on here. I think if we get the emitter sized a little bit more appropriately. Yeah, they're probably partly passing through the the walls at birth anyway, so. Yeah. So there we go. Yeah. I'm curious. And what then the thing that you always need to do is well, the friction's pretty high here already. But they'll roll. I think I would increase the friction a little bit more here. Um, it might need some. Uh, oh, is that, is that more frame? Was that just friction that you did? Yeah. Because I, uh, I, I didn't think that would stop the rolling. It's stopping them from sliding out. They'll get forced out, which is cool. Um, but yeah, they'll still roll. So I was just going to suggest a little bit of uh, more angular damping. Um, like like 50 on the angular damping would uh, stop them from rolling for inf almost infinitely. Um. Because you still want them to roll for a little while, but eventually stop. Uh, and then oh, just <laughs> That's kind of cool how they get shoved out. <laughs> yeah. Well, and, and the emitter is probably stopping after a few frames, so keep it going. Uh, Crank that to uh, infinity. I'll do it the Chris way. There you go. Now, to, let's throw in the extra variable. Trey is saying that he had the box moving as well. So maybe make the emitter a child of the box and, and vibrate the box. Yep. But I don't think that'll change anything. Should. You just have to make sure it's a moving mesh and not a static mesh. Not sure what our scale is here, so... It's always super fast. Yeah, the frequencies have to be like, you, well, I, I'm fine with it shaking all crazy, but yeah, frequency is usually pretty dang fast. Um, yeah, that's still working great. Um. <laughs> I like it. Let's just give it a little bit of color just for fun. Yeah, they, they're stacking nicely. Well, and uh, well, because you did it the cloner method, do you, we should add some sort of special variety or something. Because yeah, yeah, totally. So let's add a uh, a plane effector. No, yeah, let's add a random effector. I guess it really doesn't matter. We'll turn this to uh, vector color. 
So now the we're getting different yeah. colors there. The colors look better if you set it from zero to 100 instead of negative 100 to 100 because it's forcing them into like the uh, super negative colors. And then uh, we can add a, uh, we'll add a Lambertian at the bottom and we'll set that to the MoGraph color. And we'll add some Fresnel here. Actually, it's gonna be pretty reflective, so we probably don't want the Lambertian at all. We probably just wanna change the metallic color. Sure. Um, we'll do this, but crank up the IOR a lot, and then MoGraph color. And did that work? Did I skip a step? Oh, they, you can see the slight tint on them. Yeah. Uh, maybe so we probably a... do want the the Lambertian with the and, MoGraph color. And then turn off the uh, color channel if you're going with a kind of a physical work. Oh, through. right. That's what I was looking for. Thanks. There you go. Uh, and then we need something to reflect, but. Maybe a little more roughness. Not really. And then, yeah, we could uh, grab a sky. Maybe grab a. HDRI. And yeah, the, the if you put these all on the emitter, then you wouldn't be able to get the color variety. And even here, um, the, the, the dynamics are all being driven via the cloner. So this will all work perfectly, and they, they, you could put different scale. You'd be cloning several different types of objects. Like half of these could be cubes. Mm -hmm. um, there could be you could do all sorts of energy by putting multiple clones in there. Um, yeah, in fact, let's let's do that. Let's just create. Uh, we'll move away from the coke cans a little bit and make some let's coke just, spheres. Uh, drop some spheres and some cones. I don't know why I'm scaling them because it doesn't matter. No, it does. The relative scale matters. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that's <pretty laughs> that's kind of cool. Uh, I gotta. If we were to, uh, what it would happen if you uh, import, uh, pause and rewind to zero? But if you were to copy the dynamics tag to each of those individual objects, would that still continue to work as it is? And if so. Okay, yeah, that still works. So just for curiosity, could you grab the sphere and give it a, maybe the maybe not the sphere, maybe the cone, uh, grab the cone's dynamics and give it a custom initial velocity and see if we could like make it so that the cones want to launch their way out of the box really fast, but the other two are coming out more slowly. So for like, uh, I, the reason I'm asking is I'm curious if the custom initial velocity comes along with the clone or if it's going to be based off the particle. Right, okay. Uh, there we go. Uh, so I think it's a really strong positive X. X? Is that what I'm looking yeah, for? Yeah, I think so. That might be subtle. Put an extra zero or two on there. Don't need to be subtle when you're testing. Nope, Oops, it zero. didn't. Pew, pew, yep. pew, pew. Okay, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and it's knocking all the other ones out. So you could add custom information on there. So those could have custom spin on several. So even if this, even let's just say these were cans, you're doing a bunch of different cans. You could have some of the cans have a bunch of spin on them uh, or have different initial rotations. It's just a. I love how the box is actually shoving the pile forward at the end. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, but even even the box is introducing that that forward motion, and then you know, just as soon as you start emitting something, it's like, oh, it's full of infinite objects, and the yeah. box shaking actually does add a, a lot to the illusion of like, this isn't just like this fakey stream. It's like, no, the box is shaking. There's life to it, so it's going to keep on exploding uh, more objects forward. Uh, blah blah blah. Uh, let's see. Yeah, Trey, I would just tackle it again from scratch and just go step by step. It's a good idea to build the basic kind of skeleton of the scene, get the functions working, and then start adding all the detail. Like, do it with a cylinder before, like, a, a full can. Or even if you are doing um, the full can, 
here. You could actually run the simulation on these low, like uh, Rick is running really low poly uh, cylinders and the cans might be really high poly, but you could make a second cloner to follow the position of the first cloner so that you could run low poly simulations. Uh, I think you could also- bake. You don't even really have to do that. You could just, you could have like a high dynamic uh, can and then just go in here and set the shape to another object on the yeah. tag. Yeah, it turned into a cylinder and it would- Like if I take this longer. cylinder, here, let's see, I don't follow the rules. I, I edit while I'm- <laughs> Yeah, changing <laughs> dynamics while it's playing is so dangerous. So if I do this and I go in and I, let's just make this like, let's just crank this, right? Um, and just to prove it's cranked, we'll add like a displacer to it. This is a messed up Coke can. Mm -hmm. so oh, yeah. So it's. Oh, yeah. It's just in the same. There we go. Oh, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to drink that can anymore. No, this is this is one that's been actually we can probably dense. Um, two. One. Yeah, that looks pretty cool. I never Go thought of using and... dents as a dent. <laughs> anyway, you could you could play with that a little bit, but then what you can do is go in here and say use another object and we'll use this cylinder. Oh yeah, I never do that. Instead. And then let's hide that cylinder. Oh, and turn the cloner back on. That should be going really slow with all the, uh, if those were dynamic, that'd be crazy long simulation time. Yeah, I mean, it has slowed down a little bit, but I think that's just because of the, the level of geometry in the scene, not oh, because totally. of the, the calculation. If we were to change this to a static mesh, um, yeah, that's, yeah, this that's is not comparing. working at all. Yeah. <laughs> so if you go in and say another object, I don't think or I I've suppose ever... you could even just say cylinder y axis. Yeah, so I that, was thinking. But I'm glad you case... did I'm glad you did the other one because I don't think I've ever said use another object before, and it's a really good workflow. Yeah. Um having said all that, there is still and I like this method, and I'll be doing this more often. Um there is still validity in what I was saying that you could make you could still run the entire simulation on a low poly because it's really what you could easily turn on and off the high poly stuff, but still see your low poly simulation um, and have it be really low. Uh, but of course you could still swap these out, but you know, turning out checkbox is really quick. Um, uh, Zalam, that, that was, that was just about seeing the calculation time, not about it actually moving. Um, and you can see how slow it went. Uh, but yeah, another object. Great, great tip there, Rick. Um, okay. We're, we're already actually 20 minutes over. Do you got to go Rick? Uh, or do you want to hit one more question? Feel free to say no. You're uh, very generous with your time. I could take a quick question, but I probably need to be wrapping up soon. My email's been blowing up while we've been doing this. Uh-oh. <laughs> and uh, yeah, we, we need Rick to get back to work for, for new features in cinema. All right. I'm going to jump back to my screen to click a link. Uh, Range Attacker was really quick with a link. So let me go ahead and give this a quick looky-loo. Uh, make sure the volume is down. All right. Um, this is from Renzo Reyes. It's the UA process reel, which is Under Armour. So some sort of cloth stuff. Uh, ooh, neat. Um, now, specifically, they were asking 28 seconds in. So, okay. Blah, 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 blah. Blah, 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 blah. Okay, let's jump to right around here. Ooh, look at that. Oh, they even show a little bit of uh, there behind the scenes. It looks like it could be cinema. Yeah, um, I feel like that looks like just that same pressure that we were doing, but they're using it on an actual soft body, and they've uh, pinned, they've used a vertex map maybe to control the pressure. I'm not even, personally, I'm not even feeling uh, soft body sims on here. These are intersecting each other when they want to. Like, uh, I don't feel like these are 
avoiding intersection. So to, to me, this feels like uh, a volume, like running some sort of, uh, you know, like growing a system, like something's like shooting out, doing it, put into a volume and just doing a lot of displacement on the volume. Um, if it was pretty highly subdivided. Yeah, you might be right. That might just be animation noise on a displacer. Do you know what? Uh, is there any noise that kind of gives you this vibe? What noise mm. does that look like? Because I don't know. I, ha a... I have a coaster that shows me all the noises, but I don't have it here in front. Of me. <laughs> <laughs> Chris gave me a coaster one year. Three D. There it was. I guess it was etched, right? Yeah, it's a laser cut. Yeah. I have the laser cutter that's sitting. Uh, well, it's just off screen over there behind me. Uh, yeah, this one's. Yeah, I think that the displacement. Well, here's a question for you, Rick. What would your approach be? Because I got I got a couple of different methods that would be. But assuming that we're taking some shapes and we're gonna feed them into a volume and let them just kind of blob into each other, what would be your approach to doing something like that right there? Like put it up, like this really great growing arm look. And I mean, and, and just to double down, I do feel like it's noises because you can see it feels like it's passing through noise instead of being a consistent thing moving forward. Like as this moves forward, it feels like we're passing through a cloud of noise to me. But yeah, yeah what, what would your approach be for this kind of like? Oh, I like think the, the simplest thing would even just be to like take a sweep and clone on that sweep on the surface of that sweep and then grow the sweep out. Okay. That's a simple way. What would be a more complex way? <laughs> What's a more you asked for the simple way, didn't you? No, no. I asked what, I asked what your way would be. Um, uh, well, that would be my way. I, I'd, I'd take the easiest <laughs> route possible. Well, uh, more um, a, I, let me modify the question. What would be something a little bit more like staccato? Something that's like, it has more of like this, bursting it's like it bursts out burst out burst out like it's almost like a, a stepped energy where it's like you get uneven motion moving forward i almost feel like the most art directable way of doing it would be to to set it set it all up the way you want it whether it be from a clone setup or even manually placing things and then control the visibility of that clone or with an effector but i'm not sure how that works with volumes or the scale well, I think at volumes, it just goes to we're feeding it raw geometry. And if it moves in whatever kind of rate, the, that'll just pop into existence. But the, and the volume will just take it into account then. So I think that would work. Um, I, don't I mean, I think if you want to show my screen, we can tackle this. I mean, what I was even thinking is, so if we do something like, uh, let's just do an arc and we'll just clone uh, see I still want some shape to it so I think I would go ahead and put it in a sweep mm -hmm. and then uh, we can grab like an end side and uh, I think it was already correct yeah that's right and uh, then we can go into the sweep itself and kind of adjust the scale. Sort of like that. Mm -hmm. um, we could even, you know, have some control over that. Um, let's make this inside a little bit thicker. And then let's clone. Let's take cubes. Yeah, cubes are good. And let's clone those onto the sweep. Yeah, nice. And we'll make the cube smaller. And we'll crank this up. And then if we were to just take a... Uh, Um, just take a plane effector and scale 
And then we'll add a fall off. Good old fall spherical. off. And uh, let's see here. We guess we want to invert this. All right. And then uh, this is like, there's other ways to solve this, but the cool thing is that now we can use the decay effector or the decay field and just set maximum. And that way. Oh, I see. Wait. Interesting. Isn't it decay? Chris, yeah, yeah. help me. It would be, or uh, yeah, it's decay. Okay. Decay, and then, yeah, I mean, it has to play because it's frame dependent. Oh, right, right, right. Okay. So then we can just sort of, uh, actually, let's do this. Let's oh, align yeah, to spline onto the arc, onto the arc. And uh, see, so this is an interesting thing because I don't necessarily want it to start there, right? So I'm wondering if we can take a Mo spline, just to bring it back around. Yeah, why not? And we'll drop the, we'll put this in spline mode, put the arc in the spline, and let's just let's hide everything but the arc and the most spline for a second. And then uh, we want to extend, so we'll go this way and that way. And now we can use aligned to the most spline rather than the arc. So we've gotten some additional, we, we've, we're able to start beforehand now. And the great so, part about that is if you were to update the arc, your most spline will also update. So it's a right. very parametric setup. So we've got something like, so, and turn the clunder back on. Uh, oh, so the interesting thing What's going on here? This is the decay, right? That's not working? Uh, no. Well, I mean, turn off the decay for a second to help eliminate variables. Yeah, the decay is not. Uh, the decay max. doesn't. No? It, no, if you look at the decay, if you turn it off, it's we're not seeing the cubes grow to their. Oh, wait, there it is there when you turn it off. We did this. It's uh, inverted, so you might need the minimum. Ah, there we go. Yeah, okay. Yeah, it's because it was you did the invert. Yeah, okay. There we go. Okay. And so then, uh, you know, you, you might want it to pop a little bit more. So what we could do is go into here and actually add uh, like a quantize even maybe. Mm, maybe it needs to go there. Yeah, that would make sense. Well, it's just that's going to make a jump from once, you know, from almost no power until it's at full power esque thing, right? Yeah, that was kind of the the idea I had. We could also try like just a remap, uh, but we want that probably before the decay. No, we actually, what I'm thinking is you want to have the animation not be smooth, right? Yeah. So you almost want to jitter this. Yeah, you could, um, yeah. you could use signal for that. But, yeah, yeah, signal uh, would be excellent for that. <laughs> you could also just go in and mess with the keyframes. Like we could go into the timeline and we could just kind of, uh, you yeah. always want to be going up, so yeah, slowly sort of uh, slipping. Let's up. switch this to step, and then kind of do. Oh, I guess, yeah, it's not going to do the, I guess you wanted to do that, but be, it still be soft, but double the keyframes and uh, drag them over. You know what? Here's another, well, so another thing I was going to suggest that we could do, rather than jittering the keyframes like that, if we were just going to use a stepped thing like this, um, I wrote a plugin on, that's available on Cineversity. Of course, if you're going to use a plugin, you could use Signal for this. Um, 
but I have CV stop motion. And that basically takes any animation track and kind of uh, posterizes it. Ah. So, um, yeah, let's just run it like this. Mm, two. I can't remember which direction it goes. And in fact, it doesn't seem to want to work right now. It, does it maybe not apply the tags? So it has evaluate it, tags on. Oh, interesting. I don't know that. I've never used it. That's cool, though. I didn't know that existed. Oh, yeah. There. Now it's working. It just needed to be beforehand. Oh, interesting. Bump, Here we go. Bump, bump. Yeah, neat. Bump, 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 bump. Now you're not really getting a jitter that way, which would be cool. But Well, well jitter, jitter, jitter. Um, I'm not sure what you mean by jitter. Like just kind of jittering the value up and down a little bit, maybe. I don't know. It's a thought. But there's, there's always so many. There's a million ways of tackling everything. Wait, before you go there, I guess just one little layer that would be cool. I like your stop motion, but it'd be uh, what if you drag that onto a null instead? Move the uh, align the spline and your stop motion tag onto a null. The null will travel, and then you put the spherical field to chase after it with a spring constraint. So then you kind of do have that little bit of overlappy wiggle. Right. So I'd want to put a constraint here. Uh, yeah, the right. ring constraint. Uh, yeah, and then just have a spring constraint to chase the null. So now the spherical field is constantly trying to get to the stop motion, but it's going to overshoot it. So maybe you might want to step yours more. And yeah, drag is a good idea. Kind of smooth, smooth it out. Well, no, it will smooth it out, but is your, did, I would think that the keyframes has to go higher. Like it would step every, right now you're stepping every two frames would be my guess. So when you want to step every like 20 uh, frames. Oh yeah, maybe. Yeah, I guess you'd have to stretch out the entire timeline because we're, we're slowing it down. Right. Yeah, we're, we're, yeah, we're kind of jumping over the place. And, and we could give it fairly minimal spring. And then there's the problem with the spring in that it doesn't jump to the zero position. You have to, like, force it to go to a zero position. Um, and so it's always going to take those first few frames to get to its original position, it, it, you know, catch up. Yeah, it's just more layers yeah. we can, but you know, like we said, we could do signal. You could jitter your uh, F curve, add more keyframes. Uh, we could even you could put you could have that null be animated, make the spherical field a child of it, put a vibrate tag on the spherical field. So now there's additional motion moving along with it. Here we did a spring tag technique. There's a lot of different ways of layering it. But the interesting, like we were starting this from a standpoint of volumes, but the interesting thing about this is that these. If you aren't doing volumes, these don't have to be cubes. I mean, again, you could go cylinder, clone, or cylinder cone, could scale them down, drop those in the cloner, can randomize, although it doesn't really matter in this case, and maybe you add a push apart effector. Um, and I like using the scale apart mode. Yes, I agree. That's the only mode I like. This can be dropped down quite a bit. And then you can actually don't need those iterations. So you could do something interesting kind of like that maybe. Uh, we can bring this radius down a little bit more, it looks like. And we probably want to actually randomize the clone rotation. Where you, yeah, there's, yeah, MoGraph. You just layer and layer and layer and layer. It never stops. Hup, hup, hup. Uh, but let's go back to the volume. Yeah, sure. So That's we can just we... go back and uh, actually, let me save it at here. And then uh, we'll do that and we'll. Create a volume builder. And 
and volume measure. And it looks like in this case, we're going to want to probably make our clones. Yeah, big old they, cubes. We'll probably get rid of the push aparts because those oh, don't matter right. anymore. Yeah. But yeah, these cubes can probably be pretty huge because yeah. the effect is the inflation. And then we'll drop this a little bit. <laughs> I guess I guess you could increase your steps again or uh, decrease it because we cranked it up for the step for the spring. Uh, yeah, something like that. And now, I mean, smoothing really slows it down. Although I do like this kind of chunky geometry here. So maybe just uh, leave it at. Uh, can you hit uh, NB? Can we see the mesh? Yeah, that's pretty even. So if we were to just start throwing some displacement on top of here at a relatively large scale, then we might get something pretty, pretty good. Because this is, you know, once again, we're passing through a volume of noise. So a nice large noise that's got some definition. Yeah. And then give it more displacement. Ooh, there you go. Boom. And you know, what's great is as we're passing through the noise, you see how those kind of grow in? Like, that's what I, I love about that. And then you add, like, a little bit of that. Yep, a little bit of animation speed on there. Maybe a little bit more. Well, even on top of that, like I could see, uh, I could imagine growing the cubes inside the clone. Like those could slowly be growing oh, more, yeah, so totally. they're not left behind. You could, um... oh man, there's so many different layers on top of that. Uh, you could not do, sadly, you could not do a jiggle deformer. Sorry, EJ. Oh, there you go. Um... I like to see the cubes kind of come out. We get that double. Oh, there you go. Now it's looking gross. That's great. I wonder if you could, it's, I, we shouldn't do it, but something that popped in my head, I was thinking about Jiggle Deformer. I wonder if you could do some fakey stuff with a Jiggle Deformer where you make a, a an unrelated mesh that's kind of like the sweep, and the sweep, you kind of just pass this through as like a inflation displacer. And then you run a jiggle deformer on that. And then you run a mesh deformer on that. So then you could deform this final mesh based on a mesh that exists the entire time. So you can get that, you can get a jiggle effect with a constantly changing mesh. That'd be cool. Yeah, that'd be interesting. I don't know if it, I think it would work. I think it would work. So yeah, I mean, essentially, and I think, you know, the, the reference we were looking at is just you know getting the right noises layered up and you just keep on if we kept on uh, increasing the density here if we kept on making the volume smaller and smaller then this is going to look smoother and smoother and have more and more detail yeah um, and there's a lot of different ways this could grow i mean we just spent all the time putting the cloner there but this could just be the sweep being animated um Uh, you know, field forces could be layering up. This could be particle growth. These could be, this could be a emitter keyframed along a spline emitting out objects that are slowing down slowly, but there's a turbulence, so it'd still be breaking apart a little bit. Um, yeah. And this is when you just start playing with MoGraph, it's like, okay, this is an absolutely endless rabbit hole. Yep. Totally. In the, best, in the best possible way. Which is which is really the beauty of Cinema 4D, right? It's the ability to experiment and just keep layering stuff up in the object manager like this and and you know, oh that looks cool. Oh, that's yeah. even cooler. And and it just keeps growing. Yeah, and it's like, oh, but put a layer uh, 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 but even just how like this is super parametric. If you grab your arc and you set this to 180 instead of just 90, then everything will be updated and we'll get a fuller arc. It'll still animate along that line. It'll still expand bef before it and after it so that it still will be erased at the beginning um, and everything else will just update. And it's all fed to a volume, so the poly mesh is staying, or the mesh density is staying even. 
Well, and if you want to get really crazy, you can even do things like add a random effector to the most blind oh, itself. Yeah. And we could even add a noise. Let's drop the... Whoa. I'm changing things during playing, like, again, like oh, we're yeah, not supposed to. Constantly, yeah. <laughs> At least there's no dynamic tags this time. It seems to be changing the curl. Oh, it is changing the base mesh. I guess we got so much other undulation going that we're just not seeing <laughs> There's a lot going much. on here yeah. now. But I just kind of wanted to show that that was possible, you know? I think yeah. that's kind of cool, too. But what's kind of great, I mean, I'm kind of viewing, this is like some alien worm. It's got this curly tongue sticking out now. It's super, like, awesome and terrible. Well, awesome and thing. let's just keep, I mean, you know, this is, this is you really can just end up going through the rabbit hole. Uh, but, like, we could add a wind. What would the wind be? What could the wind affect? Well, the, the most blind it can actually be affected by the wind. Actually, it is right now. I don't know if... I don't know if I knew that. I might have known that. I'm not sure. But I if I did know that, I forgot it. So that's cool. But how Although that... it seems like the... There may be a priority thing because the wind is... Oh, no, there we go. It just was because I was playing. I'm curious how the wind... Most blind needs more points, so you can go in here and... Uh... Oh, it's for... Let's uh, count. Can increase the count of the most blind. <laughs> now it's got a curly tail. <laughs> and... Bring the wind down. Boing, boing, boing. I wonder if the volume, because it's not, tra I mean, I could see the thing tracing its way down, but it stops after a little bit. I wonder why the volume isn't getting created. Oh, the sweep. The sweep creates the geometry that we're cloning onto. So the yeah the, the reason we're not seeing it filter all the way through is we'd need to uh, pull the arc out of the sweep and feed the most blind in instead and then I think the entire rig will go although it might be a little bit crazy you might have to save before you drag it in oh there you go oh. <laughs> That's cool. <laughs> that, that, that. Yeah, there you go. You get those crazy curly tails. And the sweep is still traveling along it. So these are being cloned onto the... Well, I guess the cubes get so big, it probably the detail goes away. But if we... You know, if you had all sorts of like modifiers to stop them from scaling too big near the edge of the tail, it could get really thin near the edge. But man, that is not something I'd want to bump into anywhere. Yeah. Well, and the sweep is based on the most blind now so if we yep. scale if we add effectors to to randomly scale the like if we take this random effector let's can we simplify this again uh let's see hang on let's save as um if we can what color should we make it everybody clean some of this up that we've done Okay, so just going back to, to that Whoa. level for now. Um, Wait, what did you change that's making it stretchy? I just turned a whole bunch of stuff off. Oh, weird. Because look, at it's got this really... Oh, I guess the lack of rotation means that all of the clones might be aligned. And so we're getting these ridges along the side. Yeah, let's see here. Which is really cool. Yeah. The clones are aligned with the spline. So without right. that rotation, there's a there's more of a form to it. I like the randomness, but it's neat that we can get that like kind of consistency. Well, and the other thing that's interesting here is that if I go to this random, so right now it's it's based on position, right? But if I go through and instead I adjust the scale, um, let's just be five by five. We should see that the most blind. <laughs> is going to randomize the... Oh, that's too much, I guess. It's also... Is it going everywhere? Is it just on the tip? There's like a drip shape now. Just yeah, full circle. Um, yeah, why is that happening? 
Do we have a fall off? No. I think we did. It goes to uh, how... I don't know. It may just be this noise. Like if we... Whoa. <laughs> I don't even know anymore. But anyway, you can kind of see it here. The point I was trying to make is that you can use effectors to control the scale of the spline. And that's actually going to control the scale of the sweep. Because when you're using most spline... Oh, this is counteracting it. That's part of the problem. Uh, reset all. Interesting. It should be. Oh, well, I guess I sort of understand, but I still know why it is getting offset. I mean, so like be... if we adjust this width, that should be adjusting the width of the spline. But why is? It seems only like the most spline is only being a most spline on those extended areas. Wait, turn the random back on here. See, the width here is actually adjusting the width. So yeah. if we use an effector, and let me just create a, a new effector. Let's just use a step effector. And if we were to drop that in here. God, this box is too small. Got to complain to a developer about that. Um, <laughs> That's how we get uh, features change. We'll just bring Rick on a live stream. He'll be frustrated with something we try and do, and then it'll get fixed. Well, you've seen it happen at, at uh, NAB and SIGGRAPH before, yep. where a developer is sitting there watching somebody's presentation. and uh, Joel is saying, put the most blind in the sweep. Oh. Yeah. yeah. That's, oh, no, that was earlier. Get that yeah, a while that. ago, yeah. Yeah. It's only affecting the... Yeah, I agree, uh, Zalam. It seems to only be affecting the, the extended, like the pre-extended and the post-extended. Um, I don't know why, but... Uh, but, yeah, that's fine. See, even that's interesting, you know? It's like... Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, just the cubes. Yeah. We'll get them all tied up a little bit. Or... Uh, It'll make it go all crazy again. Yeah, actually, I'm just going to... Uh, we'll save that little experiment as E and then go back to D. Because <laughs> D was working better, I think. Yeah, this one's grosser anyway. So everybody wanted a black, shiny material on here. And then we can wrap up, I think. Let's get an okay. HDR and a black, a gross black slimy material. So let's grab an HDR. I don't have, actually, I probably do have HDR kit or some HDR browser, but just, okay. Yeah, some HDR, yeah. Uh, and let's just uh, render tags, compositing. Uh, Joel's asking if it would be possible to generate. Uh, like create different shading depending on the inflation. Um, I think I think so. I don't. I, we don't have to pursue it, but it goes to. Different we are using shading. a we are using a noise shader to drive it, mm -hmm. so that same noise shader might be able to be applied to extract a little bit of color. Actually, what would be it? interesting is maybe if we put that into the roughness. Oh yeah. So that well, that's silver. We need to make it black. Well, we also need to oh, turn a killer that shader. Yeah, kill the color shader or the color layer. I was gonna filter this. And um, do it that way. Well, it seems, yeah, okay, now you can see that there's definitely dark areas. I don't know how much they're going to correspond. And it could go to the kind of thing where you have to, like, you can't bake, I don't think you bake the texture on something that's being generated by the volume, but yeah, I don't know. But it's like baking it pre displacement. I don't know if that's a thing or not. Uh, but let's add a heavy Fresnel in here. 
Yeah, so... And then kill the color channel. I always forget that. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> now, if you don't make it look gross, we got to get rid of all that roughness. It's got to be shiny. Okay. I'll put a little in. <laughs> okay, grosser. I guess we need a lot of uh, Fresnel, uh, but... More for now, you think? Well, I, yeah, I don't know. I usually go to the... Uh, you just want those little highlights, but... The... Uh, yeah, works for me. I wonder what happens if we uh, paste that shader here, too. And maybe colorize it. Colorizer. Well, there's definitely a couple of hints of blue coming through. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's just in the color, so it's just where the reflection is. Hmm. Well, we could always just... Uh... Oh, yeah, you need the slimy layer on top of it. Yeah, I get the hints of blue. It's hard to tell with my resolution here if where the uh, if the blue is corresponding to the middle of the spots or not. But yeah, it's it's yeah. I think it kind of. I think it is kind of. The the thing to remember is the spots are the displacement and the cubes randomizing yes. at the same time. So very much so. Yeah, uh, I feel like we need to go into the HDRI. Look at us here noodling with renders, Chris. Yeah, we shouldn't be doing this. You should just <laughs> here, just uh, just uh, uh, render this out for. Let's let it render for a couple keyframes because it's it's grossest when it's moving, and then and then we'll be done. So don't don't worry. Going, we, we can go really quick on the uh, render settings. Oh, denoiser. Did you uh, do all okay? Would help if I set it to all frames, yeah. though. <laughs> it's a thing. Blech. Oh, look, I like the line is rendering. That must be the sweep still has some thickness beforehand, which is almost grosser. It's like this weird and Oh, yeah, because the sweep is on. <laughs> yeah, that's fine. I like it. Leave it there. It, it doesn't come out of nowhere then. It's got like this gross fuse that's traveling. Yeah, <laughs> not the grossest thing, but it's good. We can just make it. Uh, it's more of a, more of a mercury or a lead type of thing. No, Leo, don't tell Ridley Scott. He's uh, he's made a m enough messes as it is. The chat, the well, the old the old chat was well aware of my hatred for the mov the movie Prometheus. Oh, <laughs> let's just see what we got. Oh man, look at that! Blah, 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 blah. That's cool. It's weird and cool, but yeah, it goes to like it's something that I'm endlessly entertained by, and it's why these the show will never. It's always going to be interesting to answer these types of questions. Is um. If somebody, let's just say somebody had that on their Instagram and someone links to it, it's like, how did they make this? It's like, there's like a million different like ways that random effectors could layer up on volumes, could be layering up on dynamics, could be layered up on like, who knows where the animation is coming from? Like this is a wind and random effector driven Mo spline, but that could just as easily be a dynamic spline or something being traced. I don't know. It's just, there'd be a million ways of approaching this type of thing. And you just play and tinker and end up with weird Weird, fun stuff. Totally, totally. And I think what's what's really cool is that, and, and this is what happens on your show all the time, is that we started from reference, right? But where we ended up was completely different from the reference. Yeah, so unrelated. <laughs> it, it gave us 
a spark, a creative spark to start working, but we we still went from that and created something that was completely different and unique. Well, if you were to show this to someone, they wouldn't think they couldn't place the reference. And I think that's really important to do whenever, yeah. whenever you can. I try and stress that in my tutorials when I recorded tutorials, like, hey, take this and make it your own. Like I hear from companies that are like, why? Like, like we're so tired of seeing demo reels with just your tutorials on there. Because <laughs> if, if you're just going to literally remake what's in the tutorial, all those like project directors, the people who might hire you, they're like, I've seen this on 10 other demo reels. You got to make it your own. I agree in principle, but if they're following one of my tutorials, I love it if they just copy it verbatim because then when I see it on TV, I can say, oh, wow, I did that. Yeah. <laughs> um. And then, so feel uh, free to copy my tutorials, guys. Oh yeah, you Just guys don't can copy, copy anyone else's directly. <laughs> um, and then, again, if anybody if anybody's interested, the, all these scene files are going to be available on the Patreon. Uh, and I, I'm going to jump to my screen real quick while it's still rendering. Yep. Oop, not my screen. I'm going to jump to my screen because somebody just posted. They were working on that original question we were talking about, and they actually took that image that that we are looking at the uh, reference of uh, the. Uh, <laughs> I cannot possibly pronounce his. Uh, his name, but it's like, right. Uh, well, now it's all literally in Chinese, but it's like, <laughs> like, lick, 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 this guy, don't even try, but this they, guy. but he, or took, the gal. Yeah. This, this they person, took, uh, they took that image and brought it in. And if you use that as displacement, you're going to get a good relief. So yeah, it just goes back to tying into last week's question of if you took that two dimensional image, you could potentially extract good information from there, but you want to make, you want to be able to draw your own and make it be whatever you want to draw. Uh, totally. Let's take a look at the render where it is. And then. Oh, sorry, I was cheating and looking at chat. <laughs> um, but yeah, there we go. Blip, 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 blip. I mean, it, well, I, it, the, the, your uh, stop motion tool is great because it, there is a real, like, the way it's kind of crawling up the lead line. I, I think it's better, like, that you have this anticipation of the lead line. So I know it's just a weird thing to stumble into. Yeah. Yeah. Blip, 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 blip. I, I thought that we'd need more. I thought that we would need more springiness to the growth, but just this really blatant, like twenty percent, twenty percent, twenty percent type of growth is working surprisingly well when you have this much other motion happening. Totally, it's uh, it's pretty interesting. Uh, okay, everybody, I think we're at an hour over, so Rick stayed for a full <laughs> three hours for the stream. <laughs> so thank you. Thank you very much, Rick. My whole office is wondering where I am right now. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody. And then uh, I think you said your family was like, oh, we're going to put the stream on. So I wonder yeah. how, how long they stuck around. So <laughs> hello, Rick's family. Um, <laughs> There's no way they're still all watching. <laughs> they're like, all right, we watched two minutes. That's enough of that. Yeah. Um, anyway, uh, I've lost my window. Where's the chat? Chat, chat, chat. I got way too many windows open now. Oh, I just heard shouting from inside. I think maybe they are still watching. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, yeah, but anyway, uh, thank you so much, everybody, for coming to hang out. Of course, this could not happen at all without everybody coming in and asking questions and finding cool things that they've discovered and just weird, fun things. Uh, and especially a big, huge thanks to Rick. Uh, be sure to follow him on Twitter. And, you know, he's working at Maxon. So, you know, you know. Cinema 40. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And thanks for having me, Chris. Uh, this has been fun. It's, it's an, it's a fun little break from, uh, the usual day to day. Yep. Get you in the, get you in the thick of it. Like the rest of us where we're in the software and not uh, outside of it, poking it. Um, yeah. See, I, I'm more than just a not pretty face. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. Thanks everybody. Uh, see you next week for the stream. And then, uh, I think two weeks from now is, the C4D live. So there'll be a bunch of presentations from everybody and I'll be presenting on Wednesday with a bunch of uh, dynamic ragdoll stuff that originally started as a question on one of the streams. So uh, but I've been trying to push it further. But in any case, yeah. uh, that should wrap this up. Thank you so much, everybody. Uh, and I'll see you tomorrow on the bonus stream or next week for the regular stream. So bye-bye, everybody. Thanks, guys. Oh, I'm supposed to go in the credits. There we go.